Today, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Now, you know from listening to this show that our money is broken. Fortunately, we have Bitcoin, a better money that will help us build a brighter future. But if you don't have a Bitcoin strategy and a trusted partner to help you execute that strategy, then you're probably going to fall behind. Now, I've known the Swan Bitcoin team for years. The Bitcoiners at Swan are mission driven and have deep expertise and respect in the Bitcoin space. In my opinion, this is the team you want on your side. Today, I'd like to highlight Swan's private client services division, which guides high net worth individuals and businesses around the world toward building and preserving wealth with Bitcoin. So visit swanprivate.com and learn how this concierge service gives you direct access to your dedicated Bitcoin advisor by phone, messaging, and email. Swan will guide you on complex areas such as self-custody, or you can choose to hold your Bitcoin through Swan with one of the largest US regulated custodians. So make your first purchase with Swan Private and get $100 of Bitcoin. Just tell them that I sent you. You know, an opportunity like this to build and preserve legacy impacting wealth for your family and company will not likely be seen again in our lifetimes. Sign up at swanprivate.com today, mention breed love to your advisor, and get $100 in free Bitcoin when you make your first buy. Jason Lowry, welcome back to the What Is Money Show. Thanks, Robert. Happy to be back. It's really good to have you, man. Um, I think we should open up with this recent comment. Well, more than a comment. I guess it was like a 60 to 90 second clip by Vitalik Buterin, founder of the Ethereum Project. Um, that basically said, you know, they're, they've gone through this merge, this shift to proof of stake and away from proof of work. And he was, he made this very telling comment about that, um, which I'll, I'll just throw over to you. How, how, what were your, first of all, what did he say? And then what were your impressions about that, um, in terms of how it's been influential on what you are working on? So in terms of what did he say, I think this is a good place just for your editor to just flat out edit that exact clip in. Uh, so I think like to summarize that uh, one of the ways that I think about this in a more philosophical way is like proof of work is uh, based on the laws of physics. And so you sort of have to work with the world as it is, right? You have to work with, you know, electricity as it is, hardware as it is, what computers are um, as it is. Whereas because proof of stake is virtualized in this way, it's basically letting us create a simulated universe that has its own laws of physics. And that just gives the us as protocol developers a lot more freedom to optimize the system around actually having all of the uh, different uh, security properties that we want, right? And, you know, if we want it, the, the system to have a particular security guarantee, and then like often there is a way to modify the uh, proof of stake mechanism to also achieve it. So it's just, uh, you know, much more flexible and it shows through in the uh, efficiency and the, the uh, security of the network. When I hear this, when I hear Vitalik talking about this, what I hear is a guy who thinks that it is possible to achieve the same complex emergent behavior of system security. That is what security is. System security is a complex emergent behavior. He thinks that complex emergent behavior can be replicated using software, using a virtual reality, and and he thinks it will have the same behavior as when people use real world physics, when people use real world watts to achieve security by imposing a severe physical cost on attackers. So it's beautiful because part of my theory on soft war and, and what I've been working on is this idea that people keep trying keep wanting to believe that you can create an abstract form of physical power that doesn't spend energy, that doesn't cause injury if it's kinetic. And using this abstract form of power, you can design systems that will have the same complex emergent behavior as physical power-based resource control hierarchies. And this is a belief that's been in 
society for 10,000 years. And it's demonstrably incorrect because we've never been able to escape from the necessity of having to use physical power to achieve the complex emergent behavior of system security for all of our resource control hierarchies. And so what I see is just the next generation of people to believe the same thing that people have tried and wanted to believe for 10,000 years. They think that using some form of syntactically and semantically complex language, you can, which is what software is, which is what a computer program is. They think that you can create an abstract form of power and then use that to establish control authority over people's resources to determine the state of ownership and chain of custody of property to settle disputes. People think that you can use an abstract form of power, which doesn't spend energy and which doesn't cause entry and have the same systemic security properties as real world physical power that does use energy and that does cause injury. And that's fascinating because I can talk a lot about the history of people making the mistake of believing that abstract power will secure them and, um, and apply it to this guy who very clearly, because of philosophy, because of ideologically belie beliefs, because of moral constructs that energy expenditure is somehow bad, is somehow bad. This is a guy that's trying to replace physical power-based resource control hierarchies with an abstract form of power using a semantically and syntactically complex language. Just like every rule of law that's ever been designed. And it's going to lead to the exact same emergent effect as every abstract power ever codified, whether it be codified using pin and parchment or whether it be codified using program in Python, we can expect it to have the same complex emergent properties, which is systemic oppression, exploitation, people demonstrably incapable of defending their access to their property and the policy they value because they are physically powerless to impose costs on that. It turns out, as we've learned time and time and time again for 10,000 years, Robert, that the best form of security the best way to defend the access to the property you value, the best way to defend the policy against systemic exploitation, the best way to settle and disputes, the best way, or at least the most secure way to settle disputes, the, the best way to achieve consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody is through physical power. If it were possible, to achieve the same level of systemic security using abstract power hierarchies instantiated in code or formally codified, then there would be no such thing as warfare because we would, know, we would, need no, we would have no need for physical power. And so that's, here we are, like, this is it. This mm -hmm. is, I think, the, the, the argument that breaks the back of proof of stake. And I think it's the argument that meets my need of, showing why Bitcoin is the future of national strategic security. Fantastic introduction. Um, obviously, we're toying with some big concepts and ideas here. Um, so I'll try to share some perspectives on this and maybe bring it down to earth a little bit, hopefully, not that that's easily done. So the problem here with proof of stake is that it simply does not ground out in physical reality, right? Yet yeah, that, that is, it's like building a house with no foundation or something. It doesn't even make sense. You can't build a floating house just like you can't control the real world with proof of stake, right? There has to be some physical connection. Yeah. So, the, 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 the problem is stake does not physically exist, Robert. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yes. Yes. So, it's an imaginal structure, right? Yeah. People, software developers only recently started using object-oriented software design where they describe the complex emergent behavior of a rule set as if it were an orientation of objects, because that's what 
humans are used to. We're used to living in a three-dimensional reality where objects are oriented around each other. So we arbitrarily choose to describe the complex emergent behavior of a rule set as if it were an object, but it is arbitrary, which means the name of it is arbitrary. Stake right. does not physically exist because no software object physically exists. Software is just a set of rules that so, tell- It's a language. It's just an instruction yeah. that tells a discrete state machine what state to take. And we choose to describe the emergent behavior of those instructions as if it were an object, but it of course doesn't physically exist. Right. He understands this because he was flat out saying we can create a virtual universe. So mm -hmm. they understand that abstract reality, virtual reality is this. Some people who just don't, like you can learn computer or you can learn how to program. Like I learned how to program C++ years before I learned computer science. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I learned was object oriented software design. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any other like tool kit, tools in my toolkit to learn or how to think of software beyond. It is just a set of objects and we're getting to a, point where people are legitimately believing that this abstraction called cloud or coin or stake mm -hmm. is a physically real thing, which isn't. In Bitcoin, it doesn't matter because you're not trying to defend your, you know, you're not trying to impose costs on people or uh, who, who are trying to attack you with an abstract thing. You're imposing a physical cost on them with a real thing called real world watts. Yes. But when you use an abstract thing, stake does not exist, does not physically right. exist. The only place that stake exists is within our imagination. Yes. That means it's physically impossible to be decentralized, at least verifiably. So you can't prove that it isn't already centralized, that right. you know most of it already doesn't belong to one group of people. But even if it did, it, it, you cannot expect that something that does not physically exist will have the same complex emergent behavior as something that does physically exist. You cannot reasonably make that argument. Right. It's so you cannot, yeah, go ahead. Inconsequential. Right. It cannot, and stake, S-T-A-K-E. Let's be clear here. We're not beating up the red meat. <laughs> stake is real, S-T-E-A-K, but S-T-A-K-E is not real. It's this imagined consensus mechanism that does not ground out in physical reality. Therefore it is totally unrestrained. It's as unrestrained as the imagination itself. Yeah. And, and Vitalik says that's a good thing because the assertion being, well, we're not constrained by physics, so we can achieve levels of security, systemic security that physics can't. But the reality is that Rip. physics yeah. is the, that physics being is reality. No, the, the reality is physical constraints are the primary method of systemic security. Right. Do you see the problem there? Is, is it is precisely because physics is so constraining that we can constrain ourselves from people, abusive intermediaries specifically, right. from attacking the ledger. It is precisely because watts are expensive that we can impose unlimited severe physical penalties to people who try to deny us access to our property or to try to systemically abuse our policies. And so you can trace back the, the act of humans believing or using abstractions long before people called it stake. Mm -hmm. You can trace the beginning of when humans started doing this back to the emergence of agrarian society and all the conditions which fell into place before humans started right. going to massive scale war against each other. So th this is the idea I want to toy with a little bit here. There seems to be some commonality between proof of stake and the nature of fiat itself, like fiat meaning do this or else I will hurt you. So, or there will be consequences. Let's say the fiat works so long as people believe in the credibility of the threat, but that threat itself ultimately grounds out in some physical reality, right? You might get a, a letter from an attorney telling you to do a thing. And if you don't comply, then eventually someone knocks on your door. And if you don't comply, then eventually they physically throw your ass in jail, right? And if you don't comply, maybe they, you know, whatever, do other physical things to you, let's say. So there's this 
proof of stake and or fiat. And I would just love to hear your thoughts on if there's an overlap there, or maybe I'm just misidentifying. It seems to be kind of like this informational form of power, right? You're, you're projecting the threat of physical power, comply with this rule structure or else. But ultimately that presupposes the existence of physical power because if there's no credibility to that threat, then why would you do what anyone tells you to do? It just it wouldn't be a thing. So the abstract power of POS or fiat works so long as the constituents believe in the credibility of that threat. But there's always incentives to defect, right? No one likes to be told what to do. Typically, the, the person perpetrating the fiat or expressing the fiat is doing something for their own benefit and at the expense of the victim of the fiat. So there are incentives to defect. And if you have a defection, that grounds out in physical reality, right? Um, a bunch of Europeans came to the new world and they decided they didn't like being sending a lot of their resources back home to the UK and said, you know, this doesn't work for me anymore. This fiat arrangement does not work for us. So we're going to have a call to arms here and we call that the American Revolutionary War. So this hmm, proof of stake yeah. is just not connected to reality, I guess would be maybe the punchline here. And um, for, the, for it to work, it has to be, as we see with fiat, it has to be concretized or reified through conflict, enforcement, violence at some point. There has to be some reconciliation to physical reality right otherwise the yeah. incentives to defect rip the thing apart because people will defect people are going to do what's in their best interest so i think we're on the right track when we start talking relating stake to fiat but i think it's bigger than just fiat i, I guess not what we're talking about fundamentally is the difference between real world physical power as the basis of settling disputes, determining control authority, and gaining consensus on the quote unquote legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of any form of property. And we should say power in the physics sense. This is one that people watts. trip over a lot. Yes. Yeah. Watts. So energy per unit time. Yeah. Joules per second, energy yes. per unit time. Okay. So there's physical power in watts, which can be generated kinetically through forces displacing masses, which is injurious. It'll it'll hurt you or there's passing charge across a resistor. At the end of the day, it's still joules per second. It's physically identical. It's just the form in which it, those watts are generated is, is, is technically like electric versus kinetic. That's how we talk about it in the military. Mm -hmm. So you can, you, can, you can settle disputes, you can achieve consensus, you can establish control authority over resources using physical power, or you can do the same thing using some abstract form of power. Fiat uses an abstract form of power, technically, it does, which is then re reified or hypostatized by physical power, but we'll get to that in a second. First, we just have to establish that for some reason, sapiens started thinking of this abstract source of power and then using that abstract form of power to settle disputes, to uh, determine control authority over resources, to determine the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of property. And sapiens were the first and only organisms to do this because all these other animals use physical power to establish pecking order. They do not use abstract forms of power. Most of them, like you could argue that like, you know, the birds that are like flashing their, you know, the birds of yeah, paradise that are like right. flashing that you could technically argue that's a reified form of abstract power. And I've seen people argue that delete that for a second and just focus on the enormous propensity of animals which don't do that. Mm -hmm. And so we start to see the difference between how humans behave and, and how most other animals behave is for some reasons, human only recently, sapiens only recently started using an abstract form of power. And then if you trace that forward by 10,000 years, we get 1971 fiat, people who are saying it is more, you know, they're using this abstract form of power, whether it be called stake or something else to achieve consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of some underlying form of property. Those are the two differences. So it might be useful to look at when that started and why that started. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So 
you're distinguishing between real and abstract power, I think, if I'm not mistaken there. Uh, it's something I've referred to as physical versus political power, right? So physical power is the actual movement of energy across time. Political power is embedded in this symbolism by which we collectively orient ourselves, right? The belief in a specific symbol, the power it may have or the power it may represent. And so you've written about this and we talked offline about how much um, overlap there's been between our thinking, which I think is super interesting. I'm just going to read an excerpt real quick from this thesis to get us rolling. You wrote that brain tissue requires about 20 times more power than muscle tissue. The most energy consuming part of our brain is the modern part, the neocortex, which is used for higher level processing and abstract thinking. For shrew-like mammals, the neocortex represents about 10% of total brain volume. The average mammal's brain volume is 40% neocortex. Primates have an above average neocortex volume of 50%, but even a primate's neocortex is small compared to anatomically modern humans. A staggering 80% of sapient brain volume is neocortex. So this, the neocortex, what, I'd love for you to explain a bit about what that is, but as I understand it, um, very closely related to our spatial recognition, right? Um, in terms of planning, right? Looking across a distance and understanding the relationship of the body to a distant object. Uh, so it's closely related to visual acuity, but also related to higher order thinking. Um, what it, Okay, I'll, over to you on neocortex. The best, an easy way to think about what the neocortex does is to compare animals that have large neocortexes to animals which don't have large neocortexes. So animals with large neocortexes, whether it be birds like a, like a raven or a... Uh, like an African gray. The African gray is a great example. African grays are self-actualized. They understand the concept of self and their relationship to self. They can ask existential questions too. So they have um, what's called a higher order of intentionality. So they can they can conceive of themselves in as something unrelated to someone else, and they can conceive of the intentions of other people. Uh, it's not so uncommon in animals or mammals because mammals just tend to have larger, larger neocortexes. Primates are, like you said, or like I said, um, above average. And so once you start climbing up the neocortex volume level, you get higher orders of thinking, higher orders of understanding of self in relationship to surrounding physical environment you get far more complex social relationships and, um, and, and complex behaviors between animals as a result of those social relationships. But then you fast forward to sapiens and what you see is when animals have neocortexes as large as sapiens, they are capable of abstract thinking, which means they're capable of conceiving of things which have no signature in shared objective reality whatsoever. Like there, there is no sensory input that anyone can get or any animal can get that says, for example, future self exists, right? Like the, the idea of a future self is an abstract construct. Your future self does not physically exist. Right. You could be right. hit by a train. Like we could just, you know, ha ha get hit by an asteroid now in our future, right? It's not guaranteed. So when you have higher neocortexes, you see a lot more of imagination. That's the key um, signature of intelligence is brains that are capable of abstract thinking or imagination. And it's because brains are capable of thinking of worlds that do not exist, that humans can do things like plan which is conceiving of worlds that do not exist with 
animals and objects and places with different levels of intention intentionality. And we first started using that, we first started using like our capacity for abstract thinking or thinking of things that don't exist to help us with pattern finding, with to help us with planning, specifically hunting strategies. And then once that train starts and once you keep on feeding these neocortices with just overwhelming amounts of surplus energy because you can cook your food, you start pulling that thread and you get to a point where we can start to, to achieve symbolism, where we assign meaning, abstract meaning to things, shapes and sounds. And then we start to use that symbolism to form syntactically and semantically complex and precise higher order languages we start to use that higher order language to do storytelling, which is combining different abstract imaginary realities, like getting different brains to think about the same imaginary world. That's what storytelling means. You get two separate neocortexes to believe in the same abstract world. Right. And then once you are able to get multi, you basically create a brain network, a, a virtual reality an abstract reality which does not exist anywhere except within the imagination of the sapiens and their overpowered overclocked neocortex cortices. Once you get the ability to story tell, then you get the ability to make very, you get to start answering questions which are either people didn't think to ask like what happens after we die or you start to come up with complex abstract explanations or beliefs which is where we start to tap into theology, philosophy, ideologies, and all these other things that animals, which don't have these very large precortexes, um, which they can't do. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, it does. Um, continue, please. So when we know it's not, we, we have an idea of when sapiens started to to be self-aware to when they achieved the levels that like extraordinary high levels of self-consciousness because they illustrated that in this abstract thing called art. Right. So like within the last 45,000 years, sapiens started literally drawing themselves in environments. Right. And which is, which is an abstract idea. Right. You, you turn it we originally discovered, I think, the tracing of the hands 40 to 45,000 years ago, right? Yeah, the tracing of the hands, which is what is like on the cover of Yuval Harari's book on sapiens. But it, usually like it has something to do with animals and nature, in nature, hunting nature. But what, by doing that, they're illustrating that they understand metacognitively that there is self and there's others. They're placing them in an imaginary world, which is painted and depicted on a, on a wall, right? Obviously that those bison on the wall do not physically exist other than just as symbols. And so they started doing this. And then the other way to, to make it easy to understand that we've achieved behavior mod, behavioral modernity where sapiens clearly are able of, capable of high order abstract thinking is burial rituals. Sapiens don't bury the dead. No animal, almost all animals have just a casual, maybe passing interest in the dead bodies of their own people. Primates start to start to show like specific interest in their dead, but 50, 45,000 years ago, sapiens very clearly started to bury their dead a very unique sapient behavior, something characteristic of behavior modernity and proving that they believe in something more than just the shared physical objective reality that they're capable of perceiving through their own sensory inputs because obviously you can't perceive that after you're dead. And they're clearly capable of thinking of, an, of a future self which does not physically exist because they start burying themselves with valuable items. You, that doesn't make any rational sense unless you believe that you are going somewhere after you die. Yeah, it's, what's coming to mind for me here is, um, you know, I read Peterson's book, Maps of Meaning, and he describes 
your future self, right? Your, how you relate to your future self. He calls these, call the, let's say you as an individual, there's also this temporally extended version of you, right? You tomorrow, you the next day, you five years from now, 10 years from now, whatever. And so through abstract thinking, we can actually relate to those many slices of our future self. Um, and he called those abstract others, actually. So you're engaging with abstract others. This maps nicely onto the work of Austrian economists and, and time preference. They say that basically right. every action is a trade with your future self. So you're actually engaged. Every action you take, even if it's not an actual exchange with someone else, you know, read a book today, be smarter tomorrow, work out today, be healthier tomorrow, et cetera. You're trading, you're engaged in a process of nonstop exchange with your, with slices of your future self. And the fact that you can even conceive of future self is exactly. proof that you can think abstractly and many animals cannot do that. Exactly. There's no evidence so, to believe they can. So he makes the claim that essentially this abstract thinking and being able to engage with um, abstract others also changes the way we engage with real others, like others in now and time and space. And that relates to the orders of intentionality you, you mentioned. Like, yep. I know that you know that I know that you know, and movies right. do a great job playing with us. And it, it Our, makes, and we love it. Our brains just like oh, we love feed it. off of that. We live for it. We need, like, it's, it's yeah. what we're wired to do, basically. Yeah. And it's true. He, he makes the argument that that is essentially the discovery of time in a way, right? Like most animals don't really have a conception of time. They're just in the present, in the raw moment all the time. But when you start abstracting up and out, you're like, oh, wait a minute. I've, you know, been alive for a long time. I'm going to be alive here so I can take actions in the present that actually change my future. That he relates the discovery of time and the discovery of work. Like this is the unique human um preoccupation right that we and well he makes the point that that uh the adam and eve story sort of represents that that you, mm -hmm. you the fall of man the discovery of time you've got to work forever you know there's never enough there's always more work to be done so i think that's all super interesting how it's, it's mythologically encoded as well even though what we're talking about is kind of cutting edge you know biology i guess or I'm not yeah, sure what anthropology, are. maybe anthropology. And so the neocortex is it's seems to me like it's somewhat of a Monte Monte Carlo simulator for action, something like that, right? Instead of just acting and seeing what happens, you can run simulations of action and you can tweak parameters and tweak participants. And then you can yeah. let the ideas go to battle and die so that your body doesn't have to. I think Schopenhauer said something to that effect. And, and why do we do Monte Carlo simulations, Robert? There's a reason why we rely on those so heavily. To make better decisions and better, I would assume, means... Um, we can do trial and error. Otherwise, right. we don't necessarily need a Monte Carlo simulation. So the reason why we love modeling things or running Monte Carlos is because it's cheap. You're not constrained by right. physical reality. You're not, um, if you're trying to like figure out what's the best way to hunt a herd of caribou or a woolly mammoth, mm -hmm. right, something that's way more powerful than you, then you should probably run those simulations in your brain where you're not gonna be gored by a woolly mammoth. It's safe there is less capacity for physical injury in the abstract world because there are no watts or there are no uh, masses to displace with force. Yes. And so but, just, but, yeah. But the simulation's cheap, but you have to verify it in the hunt. Exactly. And so you yeah. have a feedback loop. Yes. So you have this idea, this abstract idea, this is the best way to hunt caribou. You've created a virtual simulation in your brain. All right, I've run all through all these different scenarios using my higher order of intentionality. If I do this, the caribou is going to do this. If my buddy over here is on this corner of the cavern and I'm on this corner of the canyon or whatever, this is how it's going to run through. And then we test and then we act according to, we shape physical objective reality based off of what we think ex post facto. 
and we try it, we see what works, we see what doesn't, we gain those physical sensory inputs and then we update our model and we do that over and over and over and over again and we get really good right. at, what, that, at predicting where the caribou is gonna be during what time of the year, they're gonna go through this canyon. So let's park ourselves at the top of that canyon and once they go through it, let's rain down spears on them mm-hmm. and kill them and eat them. And so abstract thinking, is what enabled not only the concept of time, but also the, this idea of planning. And mm-hmm. we used it initially to improve our ability to detect patterns, to, to hunt and to collect flora and fauna and, and do whatever we need mm-hmm. to do for our normal upper paleoithic needs. Right. But it does, hopefully you can see that once we've figured out, you know, once we've pushed abstract thinking into the future, a little bit where we can actually, and we, we can now communicate to each other using semantically complex meaning, um, rich with meaning. Mm-hmm. Humans love that, abstract thinkers love that, mm-hmm. applying meaning to things, but also syntactically complex. So like mathematically precise. When we talk to each other, when we speak to each other using our mouths, like right now, we're, this is only symbolic knowledge that we're transferring to each other. We're not actually right. transferring shared objective physical experiences through each other. My neocortex is filling your neocortex with symbols and ideas, and you're able to process it yes. because we've created this higher order syntactic and semantically complex uh, language that we both understand the, the rules of. by the open source technology called English, right? Right. Yeah. We just created a protocol. Yeah. And we both understand, like if I were talking in a different language, you, my brain would not be able to communicate to your brain. Right. right? But the, because consensus, we have, the consensus isn't perfect either, right? Like how you oh, consider I know that. the <laughs> definition of a word and I consider the definition of a word. It's good enough for us to communicate, but yeah. your filter is slightly different than mine. It's, it's interesting. It's a, it's a yeah. good enough consensus, maybe. Semantic ambiguity, especially between words like violence, do get people in, in trouble. <laughs> right. um, so it's not perfect. And by the way, the, it's not even like our main form of communication either. Our main form of communication is the same for basically all primates, which is grooming each other, laughing, singing, dancing. Right. We were using baser layers of communication thousands, hundreds of thousands of years before we invented spoken language. Yes. It's just, so it's, so it's not spoken language is not our primary means of communication. Our primary, it's just a way for us to be more semantically and syntactically complex so that we can kind of align our abstract realities a little bit closer and believe in kind of the same thing with some ambiguity. Yes. To get us to that flexible cooperation in large numbers that Harari writes about, it's almost Hmm. So you, to get pro- us to the point where your Monte Carlo simulation matches mine. So we both, I think we know what the best way to hunt caribou is. Mm-hmm. We both share the same shared mm-hmm. abstract reality and we both act according to that shared abstract reality mm-hmm. and shape objective reality through our physical inputs ex post facto. So we believe the same thing and then we act physically according to our abstract beliefs. Right. And because we do that, we can, very effectively hunt pack animals that are much, much larger to us. Fast forward a couple thousand years right. with a bunch of shamans speaking every night across um, campfires doing storytelling. And we start to construct all kinds of immensely complex and meaningful abstract realities that have nothing to do with hunting, but which have, which answer questions about what happens after we die or answer questions about why do we instinctively feel this way or that way? Why does, you know, what we observe in nature happen? We can use our abstract thinking capabilities to offer satisfying explanations for those. Yeah. And this, so between the symbol or the symbolic structures that we're creating and then the actual actions, there's this feedback loop as we've described, right? But, and so that, that becomes a shared abstract reality, you know, through, through storytelling, virtual reality. Yeah. Virtual reality. 
But that virtual or shared abstract reality is always provisional, right? It's always what works based on what we figured out so far. If you, mm-hmm. you know, we've been hunting caribou, throwing the spears down into the canyon, then a guy figures out gunpowder and it's like, oh, wait a minute. We need to change our shared abstract reality because this thing works way better, right? It's way more efficient at getting us calories per unit of effort. And so is that what's going on here is, is we've, this is like evolution extending itself a bit where we're wiring together our neocortices with language, with storytelling, later with money. And it's so that we can um, more rapidly, because the shared, the abstract reality also, it, it, it crystallizes knowledge in a way that can be passed across generations, right? Like once you figure out how to make the wheel or whatever it is, you've got the blueprint for the wheel. Well, that just gets passed along and you can't really uninvent the wheel kind of thing. And, and once you invent written language, you can pass on semantic and syntactic beliefs right. 2000 years into the future. So you can talk to people well outside of your own lifespan, which is what Cicero does when we read his work. Right, right. So and this, this is where I feel like it's the algorithm of evolution itself extending beyond the biological substrate. Right, like this, the same process biology is doing in a way, right? It's throwing proverbial spaghetti against the wall, keep what works, discard what doesn't. But now we've taken that up into our conscious reality and we, we're doing the same thing with, with innovation. Innovation is like a non biological evolution. I think we've talked about this before. Yeah, that's like I quote you on that all the time. But it's like here's the break point somewhere. I, I'm not sure exactly where it is, but. Um, the, the once we figured out symbol, we kind of like take the reins of our own evolution to some extent. Yeah, it it gets weird because there were clear physiological changes because of our like the reason why childbirth is so dangerous is because we have weirdly large brains. Like our foreheads are bulbous and very strange compared to the foreheads of every other surviving animals, they grew so fast that they actually outpaced the evolution of our own pelvises. Right. And so humans are born like 50% prematurely. They don't even have like fully formed necks or skulls. They're totally helpless compared to other large primates when they're born and many other pack animals, just because our brains are so physiologically unnaturally enlarged because of our technology so you have technology changing you said innovation is the non-biological form of evolution but it actually does change our biology in such a way and you can you can trace that because humans that figured out how to control fire have much larger foreheads than the other primates that didn't but yeah and then it's like like we've been talking about you can now run monte carlo simulations into the future and start thinking about ideas and then testing them in reality so because we can think abstractly we can think of innovative things and then imply them using physical output and then yeah so so now we can evolve ideas we can use the evolution of ideas to affect shared objective reality through the technology and then those technology f- technologies physically physiologically have an effect on us it's it's all a big old yes. loop that they all feed into each other yeah that uh, it's funny because innovation being non-biological evolution presupposes that there's some distinction between biology and inorganic reality and that distinction is pretty there's, there's a continuum there right it's yeah yeah, this gets into like ontology. If there is a distinction, it it's hard to verify where like biology ends and right. another thing starts. The, the and, line between living and non-living is something we just, again, in our imagination drew, right? And said, oh, this is living, this is non-living. But Which is technically why it's really hard to make a formal distinction between shared objective physical reality and shared abstract reality because yes. we don't really know what those differences right. are especially because we live behind prefrontal cortexes that can only right. apply abstract <laughs> meaning to every physical input that we receive through our sensors uh there's a man there's a quote in here somewhere that's really good and the, the other thing i would add to that is just that information theory also tells us that information itself is physical right we so we can't distinguish we're we're, we're 
using our imagination, we're putting these things in two different buckets as if there are two different universes, but it seems like there's actually a deep continuity between them. And that that is what we're exploring here with our words. I want to read this one excerpt back to the bulbous heads. You wrote, humans enjoyed a step function rise and surplus energy when they took control of fire, which they vectored towards performing the highly energy intensive task of thinking. The brain represents only 2% of a modern human's body weight, yet it consumes 20% of its energy. Fortunately, humans become so rich in surplus energy that they were able to habitually overclock their neocortices to the point where it drove dramatic physiological changes, giving rise to the modern sapiens massive neocortices and oddly bulbous heads. So it was that, I mean, it was a, techno a technological improvement right harnessing energy as a harnessing fire rather as an energy tool that actually led to a step function change in our evolution yeah it had a systemic effect on we basically selectively bred ourselves kind of, i don't maybe not that i don't know how to explain it but like because of systemic effects we are a completely different species than other primates that didn't learn how to right. control fire. Yeah. Again, there's another blurry line here between artificial and natural selection. Like was that natural selection that we discovered fire and therefore it changed our evolution or was that because it involves our agency and choice, does that make it some form of artificial selection? Like where do you draw the line? Yeah, it's hard. So, so I recognize that and my solution to it is just to formally define what at least I think is quote real and which I think is quote imaginary. And the best one I could think of was stuff that is real is stuff that can produce its own like physical signature in this thing called shared objective reality as best we understand what that means without having to use abstract thoughts, without having to use a, a neocortex to conceive of it, which existed and were precedent to the emergence of humans by 13 plus billion years and then imaginary things are just everything that aren't physically real things by that definition so like if it can produce its own physical signature and shared objective reality if it's one of those things like what we conceive of as time mass energy space things which as best we can tell incontrovertibly existed before we did that's real that's physically real. And then all this stuff that isn't that, these abstract ideas that we have, these, um, these Im in imaginary worlds that we explain to each other through our, our languages and our stories, those aren't physically real. Those are abstractions. Right. And it's something like independent verifiability, making a thing real. Yeah. If you're, yeah. if a spider can, see, smell, touch, taste it, and you can see, smell, touch, taste, or hear it, then that is a clear sign that what you are experiencing, what you are seeing is something from the domain of shared objective reality. And by the way, that ain't steak. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Watts, you can see or I guess you can't see, but you can definitely touch it. You can definitely detect it using your physical sensory inputs. You know when your mass has been displaced by force. Um, that is something from shared objective reality. Stake is an abstract construct. We think that the complex emergent behavior of software can be explained as something like an object, but if obviously that object does not physically exist. In regards to this feedback loop between symbol and action, um, you wrote this, that minds produce a mental model of the world, which influences the way people think, act, and perceive the information they receive back from their senses. Brains, therefore, act like a lens through which sapiens understand the world via shared abstract reality while simultaneously acting as the mechanism through which sapiens can shape shared objective reality. This bi-directional feedback and dual use 
type of abstract thinking where the brain's imagination influences the processing of its own physical sensory data inputs and physical outputs appears to be the root cause of a phenomenon called symbolism. And now throughout this thesis, you're always acknowledging, hey, look, this is how I'm using the term in this paper. I know there's a lot of other work and philosophical thinking about this term, um, but just clarifying how, you know, clarifying your language, which is great. And then yeah, one of the one you wrote is, um, ironically, this means humans can't do what other animals do effortlessly, which is to experience objective physical reality for what it is without skewing sensory inputs through the mind's lens of abstract and imaginary biases. Whereas non-human animals often perceive, I'm sorry, often cannot perceive symbols and abstract meaning in the first place, sapiens can't not detect symbolic patterns and abstract meaning once a given pattern has been committed to memory. The reader is invited to test this out. Try to look at this page without detecting symbols like letters and words, or try to listen to someone produce the audible wave pattern of your name without detecting that abstract concept called your name. Most people find this to be impossible, except for people who are drugged, brain damaged, or experiencing severe memory loss. So we're just wholly and totally immersed in this symbolic or imaginary reality all the time. Yeah, we're in prison behind our own neocortex. And if you have ever had those weird experiences where like you see a word, but you for like, it's like, wait, have you ever thought about just how weird the word win is? Like, what is that? Or you like look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, who is that? And you have this like instant out of body experience. Sometimes your brain will randomly not apply symbolic meaning to a word or to a pattern, which is your face. And you won't really make the connection and you'll it'll just be like what the hell well that's you share experiencing objective reality through your own purely experiential knowledge not through symbolic knowledge and it's so trippy that you think you're on drugs because it's like this is so different than the shared objective reality that i live in normally and so most people can't just turn it off like you can't just turn off your knowledge of english and look at a at a piece of paper and not see the symbols and not see the symbolic meaning. Yeah, it's a great point. And I, you know, my takeaway there is that all, and you see this with kids, right? Kids grow up playing imaginary and we think we stop, I guess, when we become adults at some point, but like, no, we are always engaged in imaginal play. The play just gets more serious in, in adulthood, right? And more people agree with you. And yeah, there's, there's broader consensus, and, but, you know, nation states, the flag, money, language, these are all just symbolic, imaginal constructions. Yeah, they're totally imaginary. They do not physically exist. We, we grow up and we practice imaginary thinking as our brains are maturing through playing house in the woods where you like rake the leaves to shape the form of the house and you have imaginary friends and you have imaginary conflicts. And mm -hmm. that's what all play is. It's just people pretending to act. They're like basically LARPing, right? They're just like pretending to act according to, and then we look at that and we judge them. They're like, that's stupid kid. Doesn't even know that house doesn't exist. Obviously your imagination, you know, yeah. obviously that's imaginary. Yeah. And then we talk about like nation states or these other, com you know, complex as, or, yeah as if that's a thing yeah, right but it's not a thing <laughs> yeah like you you know yeah you judge the kid for playing imaginary then you put on your suit and tie and go to office uh, go to the office at your imaginary corporation right to receive your imaginary money it, and take orders from someone with imaginary power and yes. imaginary control over you right yes such a great point and the on the back of that takeaway, I think, to me, it opens up this perspective that humans are effectively programmable in a way, right? Like we're, we're, we're engaging with this software, the symbolic software in the world. It's integrated into our mind to some extent. He who can control the symbolic software can have a very, can have a significant sway on the individuals acting within that symbolic structure. Yeah, if if you're a good storyteller, yes, 
you can con- you can mind control people. People like the psyops is like a meme. It's like no, that's how sapiens work. That's how we work. Like everything is psyops. Yes, and this is what this is, goes back to Plato, right? Plato said, "He who tells the best stories rules society." Exactly. So. What is a story? A story is a bunch of people believing in the same virtual reality by virtue of the higher order language that you are communicating to them. You're filling their brains with symbolic meaning, syntactically precise meaning, and convincing them to believe in this thing called rank or this thing called stake or this thing called the nation state or all these other, you know, this thing called affluence or money or even morals or even, you know, every field of theology or like many of the forms of theology, even science, so much of everything that we think is real is actually just a bunch of people telling stories. Yes, but the the believability of those stories grounds out in physical reality, right? So the the nation state, right? The United States had to be born in the bloodshed of revolution, right? There was violence that got this imaginal order to exist, right? And persist in the minds of men. Money, right? Over time to persist. Well, gold was, had a proof of work. And we'll obviously talk about Bitcoin as being this ultimate form of proof of work. That's what it's the integration to physical reality that upholds the persistence or longevity of the uh, virtual reality. Exactly. So kids are a bunch of LARPers. So are adults. Adults will believe in some type of moral or ideological good. Adults will believe in the concept of a nation state and the concept of rank and the concept of some type of abstract power hierarchy. And then they will shape shared objective reality through physics, through the watts that they project to make shared object, objective reality match their abstract reality. But they're doing right. that ex post facto. That's why it's like a bi-directional symbolism is of like a bi-directional thing is because we shape shared objective reality that kind of influences our symbolic beliefs about it in our abstract reality. And then that informs our output So our input is informing our output, which is informing our input, which is informing our output. But if you were like any other animal and you were just watching sapiens do this stuff, it would have like, they would look kind of weird and insane. It's like, why are they lining up and, you know, dying for things that don't exist? Right. Yeah, this this idea that we are, in a way, we're etching our imagination into the natural world, right? So through work, yeah. through the use of these symbols, but I, I like I'm sitting in a house right now and I'm struck by, well, this was definitely a blueprint before it was a house, right? Before it was a blueprint, it was probably just some guy's dream or idea. And so all of that virtual reality gets etched into the physical reality through the projection of power, ultimately. So. Yeah, and like what existed before that house was was the surface area of the earth. And 10,000, maybe call it 15,000 years ago, sapiens didn't even conceive of the concept of you could own portions of the earth, much less build houses on it, much less should. Yes, yeah, yes. (laughs) So so you, you just take for granted that people have, quote, homes it's like that's a concept that's an abstract construct upper paleoethic sapiens 20,000 years ago would think that they would look at what you're doing in your house and they would be like you're crazy that is a terrible life yes. you just encaged yourself and you have no capacity to understand how unhappy you are because you've never seen or experienced a world outside of your agrarian cage that you live in of course they could not formulate that argument but yes they probably think that right Yeah, but but this is important because what we're talking about is different applications of abstract thinking and how it affects the behavior of sapiens and 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 how those sapiens act according to their abstractions, not according to their experiential knowledge. Like we've never met Robert. 
I don't know if you're, for all I know is you're a complex AI. The only inputs that I have that you exist are symbolic. I see a picture on a screen. I hear these words, right? I read your tweets. I have no idea if you actually physically exist. I have no experiential knowledge of you. I only have symbolic knowledge of you. Yes. Yeah. And this is, go ahead. Everything you read is that. So if you think you know un or understand the world because you read a bunch, you don't. Um, there's very big differences. But in fact, almost everything you know is symbolic knowledge, not experiential knowledge, because it's so much easier to read and watch TV and talk to each other on Zoom than it is to be physically present with them to get those physical sensory inputs. So m almost everything we think we believe everything we know is, is nothing but symbols and we act according to that. And whenever you remind people of that, they freak out. They have like existential crisis, crises or, you know, they like metacognitively trip out. Like I was in this argument with these like Ethereum people the other day and I was like, you do realize steak isn't real, right? And they just like, like what? What do you mean? Of course it's real. It's like, no. It's yeah, I mean, and this gets to. I've talked to cognitive scientist John Ravaki a lot about this. What we're calling, you know, abstract knowledge versus real knowledge. He he breaks down the four P's of knowing. So it's propositional knowing, right? Is to to know the idea, but then there's these other three levels of knowing that we've largely forgotten about, which he calls the procedural, the perspectival, and the participatory. So it's just the embodied knowledge right to the know-how or in the case of perspectival the knowing how to indwell someone else's perspective right to to empathize things like this and so without going down that rabbit hole and this gets to the basically to the purpose of your paper to distinguish between what is abstract and what is real right what is symbolic and what is uh, objective physical reality it seems like there's this line of the symbols are very cost effective that we can run a lot of these simulations very cheaply, but then ultimately you can only take one act, right? You can only act once. Um, so there's this, this complementarity between the two. We have one very cost effective mode that we can generate a lot of simulations and try different things, but then ultimately you have to eventually try it. You have to throw the spaghetti against the wall and see if it sticks. Um, and then that obviously informs your future thinking and, and um, simulations, so. Exactly, and, and that cuts straight at the heart. So it's cheaper, right? Less energy required to mm -hmm. do it. And then the other point that I made earlier about hunting simulations, less injury required. Yes. So you don't have to spend watts and you don't have to risk being hurt by watts. So you think as much as you can and you run these Monte Carlo simulations in your brain to under try to understand what's the best way to hunt the caribou. And so that's exactly why humans, well, that's not exactly why, but that is what is happening when we use abstract forms of power to settle disputes, right? To mediate disputes, to determine what is the proper resource control authority, to determine and achieve consensus on what the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of resources is. All pack animals have by an existential imperative they must establish a pecking order. There's only a limited amount of food, okay? You must decide who gets what resources. Animals do, who do not think abstractly say their heuristic is feed and breed the most powerful in the pack because the most powerful people are, in, uh, in, are capable of imposing the most severe physically prohibitive costs against our pack. So we have the highest probability of sort of security and survival if we let our most powerful um, members of our tribe have first dibs. You'll notice that like animals don't right. wait in line for their kill, right? The alpha walks it up and he takes what he wants and then he's full and he walks away. So by natural selection, animals have to choose what the pecking order strategy should be. And by overwhelming majority, they always choose feed and breed the most power projectors. That's why we are attractive to pe attracted to people who are powerful. Humans are no exceptions. Mm -hmm. Mr. Viking blooded 
big deltoid <laughs> guy like <laughs> right like, like well it you probably want... speaks to our obsession with athletics right the, the, yeah. you know it's kind of uh, a descent from the gladiatorial days of you know seeing what people people are capable of because when push comes to shove you're going to need the power the most capable physical power projector to project some power all in like not all but look at animal packs nature look in nature you will see sexual dimorphism you'll see parts of the packs that are physiologically stronger bigger muscles sharper teeth bigger antlers sometimes it's the females that project the power like the tyrannosaurus rexes or you know like other different species sometimes it's the males but the point is they will specialize they will have dedicated power projectors and those dedicated power projectors get first dibs on the food usually and they're deemed instinctively as more sexually attractive so they'll they're more likely to transfer their genes into the future so natural selection has already aligned itself such that whatever we're going to do we're going to try to make sure that the physiological powerful people of our pack have the most food and the most probability of sending their genes forward because that is what survives the ability to what is secure is your ability to impose physically prohibitive costs on people mm -hmm. who would try to attack you whether it be other animals whether it be the entropy of nature itself power is god in in the world of of nature mm. right like if you cannot project power then you have a much if you cannot impose a physically prohibitive cost on on something attacking you then your prob the benefit to cost ratio of attacking you is going to go through the roof and you will be devoured by something in that environment it's a it's a fantastic point and i I think Nietzsche was right about the will to power, if you consider it in just this sense, the physics sense. So let's talk about that. Like because to be alive is to be channeling power, right? Yeah. So this is key because this is why, like what we're talking about, right? Because you're starting to like, you know, you're start, we're talking about, we're starting to thread the line between like morality and are we sociopaths and is it, is feed and breed the powerful projectors first morally or ethically good or not? Well, one thing I wanted to say, sorry to interrupt, but just that one point, feed and breed the most effective power projectors, the symbolic realities we create do change that too. Because I would say women Especially alive today, they would prefer to mate with the rich, successful, charismatic guy to the buff guy in many cases. So, um, and that, that to me is um, sexual attraction to intelligence. Mm. so being an effective because like cuttlefish do this cuttlefish will hide their sexual dimorphism like they'll be you know the, the male cuttlefish will pretend to be female get up oh, close I've seen this. yeah right right and then like do it with the ladies and then like leave before the power so power projection isn't just about your biceps it's also about your intelligence too that's why i'm not like that's why, like, if we got in a fight, me and you, Robert, I don't care that you can, you're way more physically powerful than you because I can, I got access to a lot of technology. I, I know a lot of nerds. Like, we can come up with ways <laughs> to make sure, right? Like, that's what the Space Force is. You know, I don't need to be physically strong to kick ass. Right. right? So it <laughs> and, speaks to this, the, the technological realities significantly influencing the symbolic structures we create and how we relate to one another. And the ability to survive and protect power is not just linked to our physical power, but also our ability to use that effectively through intelligence. And so when you see someone who is rich, you see someone who is intelligent and, you know, primates do this too, but like your status in some social hierarchy is it's a it's basically just a good heuristic to know that like okay more intelligent people will, will probably be like what intelligent person would want to be poor i guess is the is the word right. like you know so yeah. so and there it, that gets way more complex just because humans themselves have much larger neocortexes so it's not strictly 
Well, they don't do things based purely on power. That's why we have abstractions like rank. That's why we have rank based hierarchies. Those are not based on power, but it's important to at least acknowledge that there is a difference and then to, ex to, then to explore why humans do it. Because I think that's the core to understanding why the difference between proof of work and, and proof of stake. Because proof of work is proof of power. Proof of work is proof of watts. Right. Stake is rank. Stake is an abstract form of power. So let's, I'm going to read this excerpt. We're going to get into proof of power now, I think. So what I first need to do is read this excerpt of you defining the real. You write, real things, according to the author, can be categorized, the author you're referring to yourself, can be categorized as things which produce their own physical signature in the domain of shared objective reality, as best as we currently understand what that means. For simplicity, imaginary things can be categorized as everything which isn't real. The author understands the subject matter experts devoted to the study of what real means don't make this same non-physical versus physical distinction. He apologizes in advance <laughs> to professional philosophers who may cringe at an engineer's obvious bias towards physics and begs for your temporary indulgence. Quite yeah, enough. I don't know if that's going to make it into the final cut, but I just <laughs> thought it was too funny to write it. Great, you know, though. this is the engineer showing his bias, right? Like, mm -hmm. obviously, the engineer is going to have extreme bias towards physical reality because the engineer is just the person who learns a bunch of physical equations and tries to figure out how to use them to shape our shared objective reality to what we want it to be. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have an enormous bias towards science and towards the towards physics than I am going to than other people. And I acknowledge that. But this is an engineering. This is a technical thesis by an engineer at MIT. So, so we just had to put that out there. The indulgence you know? is warranted. Yeah. Well, and in this case, it's critical because you have to be able to make this distinction to understand the difference between proof of real and proof of something that doesn't physically exist, because they are going to have very different complex emergent behavior to include systemic security behavior. It's a great point. Um, okay. Let's see if I want to read this real quick. I have to read this. This is a long excerpt, but it's really good. So here we go. <laughs> you wrote, because sapiens have so much thinking power and are so inclined to believe imaginary things are real, they behave unlike any other animal on earth. They strongly and passionately believe in things they have never seen, smelled, heard, tasted, or touched. They act, react, and show extreme favoritism towards symbols and operate either oblivious to or consciously unconcerned with the difference between abstract things and physical things. They will respond to stimuli which exist nowhere except within their imagination, more often and far more passionately than information received by their sensory inputs from physically objective reality. They will ignore their experiential knowledge altogether and act strictly according to symbolic knowledge, often not even aware of the fact that they are doing it. They will stop paying attention to the fact that they're sitting down and doing practically nothing because they are entranced in an abstract world spoken or written into existence by a stranger using higher order semantically and syntactically complex language. If you are reading this, look around for a second and realize that you're just sitting still, doing nothing but staring at images on a paper or a computer screen. I did notice I was doing that when I read that originally. <laughs> Sapiens, unlike any other animal, can and will subject themselves to a great deal of personal sacrifice and suffering for reasons which don't exist anywhere except within their collective imaginations. This is perhaps the defining feature of the human experience. I mean, people just need to understand that. That's well, we the difference between sapiens and other animals. As best but, as I can see it, the but big we're one. so wrapped up today. I mean, despite this richness of symbol, symbolic, imaginary world that's all around us, we're swimming in it all the time. It seems to be like the materialist paradigm kind of reigns, right? Like it, there, there's people don't give enough credit to the importance of symbols and these imaginary symbolic structures, I guess would be my point. Yeah, they don't get enough credit to it. And even if you do, like we are clearly capable of thinking this, we are clearly metacognitively aware 
that were acting according to and taking sacrifices according to things which don't physically exist. And we don't care because in our brains, things which are abstract, which are generated through our theologies, through our physiologies and our ideologies, we treat those things which do not physically exist as equally as important as things that do. And in often cases, more important than things that do. That's why we suffer for these higher causes that may not necessarily even be physically real at all. That's, that's a great point. Um, and, and that's why we have rank-based hierarchies. That's why we subject ourselves to governments. That's why we do all these things. It's, it's because we are willing, we are inclined to believe in abstract things like abstract power, and we're willing to sacrifice according to those abstract power hierarchies for theological, ideological, philosophical reasons. And, and this gets to the core of why rank exists, why stake exists, why humans keep on thinking that it would be, quote, ideologically better to establish resource control authority, to establish consensus on the legitimate state of chain of custody of property using abstract things like stake or rank versus physical things like watts. For whatever reason, for ideological reasons, right, for reasons that do not physically exist, humans believe that the use of physical power to establish control authority over resources and to determine this state of custody of property they believe that these physical power-based hierarchies that we use, that other animals use too, that natural selection, we very clearly believes is the best way of surviving. For whatever reason, sapiens believe that's morally bad. It's morally bad to project physical power to establish control authority over resources and determine legitimate state of chain of custody of property. Why? Because it uses energy in the case of why proof of stake exists or why? Because it causes injury, which is why we condemn physical power projection. But like those are like, you go, go talk to a lion, right? You know, a lion doesn't give a shit, right? right. Like you, you, I, and you haven't seen it, but I have an entire section on here in the a chapter before this one called Mufasa was a murderer. <laughs> That's the name of the section. <laughs> it's like what Disney doesn't show you is how Mufasa came to become the leader of the pride and what he did when he got there. What he did when he got there is he murdered every single cub in that, in that pride. Right. And he didn't think it was bad. In fact, everyone else in the pride accepts it, yes. right? This is what we must do to ensure that we feed and breed the most powerful people that we as a pack have the maximum probability of imposing the most severe costs on attackers to survive. Right. And so, and, and so this gets back to abstract thinking. It's because humans, by all accounts of psychology, as best as we can tell, have natural instincts that want us to not kill each other. Like humans are not inclined to kill, killing each other, as surprising that may sound because of how much we do. But um, Grossman and uh, his book on killing and all, a bunch of psychological studies have made it really clear that humans very much do have a natural um, instinct not to physically injure other humans. Mm -hmm. So for example, like um, the famous example of is when they collected all the rifles off of all the dead soldiers at the Battle of Gettysburg, 80% of the rifles collected off of de dead soldiers were never fired. In fact, they were double and triple stuffed with ball and powder. So not only were they never fired, they were faking their shots. 80% of every dead person, of every dead soldier, you know, when they pick the rifles off of them, they never fire the shots. This is a, this is actually a really common problem in militaries. Hmm. We, we, that's why we have to train. We have to train out of the natural instinct not to hurt each other. And that's why warfare became far more lethal when we, started being able to see the people that we're shooting at. Wow. You, when, you, when you just have to press a button, you're behind a computer screen or you're 5,000 miles right. above, you never actually have to see the injury that you're causing 
Mm. It becomes much easier to kill each other at scale. But, and, and so what we do is we create abstract constructs to, to, to explain that, to explain our natural instincts. We will say, oh, the reason why we must feel disinclined to kill each other is because it's morally bad. Mm. Is it morally bad or are we just coming up with abstract constructs to explain mm. our natural instincts that we have through natural selection? Well, yeah, or, or are we, because I know we have mir mirror neurons, right? Where you see someone get injured in a certain way. You see someone break their leg really nastily. You kind of feel it, you know? You oh, God, yeah. Hurts. Like that basketball player when his brother, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so it, maybe it's that. Maybe the the description of morality is like describing the feeling of that, that mirror neuron effect, perhaps. But not to speculate there, I, I would just say that there are definite economic advantages to deferring to abstract reality, right? Just like we said way back when, rather than fighting to the death of every sandwich, right? We could just have a protocol like, you know, the rule of law or uh, a social convention, something like that. that. That's clearly, that's an economic advantage, right? It, it serves a real purpose, but it has to ground out in reality at some point if, because then if someone just decides there's one guy that decides the sandwich distribution protocol. Well, he's probably going to twist that protocol to get him and his friends some more sandwiches at the expense of everyone else, et cetera. Yes. So it's, it seems like the real fight in sapien land is on this imaginal landscape, right? And this is the domain of well, a lot of people, really, like rhetoricians, politicians, entrepreneurs, even scientists, right? They're playing all these tools, trying to describe mm -hmm. reality in new ways. But ultimately, there has to be this act of reconciliation where you distinguish the real from the, the abstract. And I think that's related to your proof of real or proof of power. Yeah. So what is every, if you think you're dreaming, what do you do? Right? Like it, you pinch yourself. If you don't know if you're dreaming or not, you pinch yourself. If you want to know if something that you see in front of you is real, you poke it. So what are you doing? You're searching for sensory input, physical sensory input. If I poke the thing, the mass of that thing will displace the mass of my finger, right? It's generating its own physical signature. Therefore, it must, that I can detect through my hands, which is matching what my eyes are seeing. And so you think that, okay, this must be real because when I poke it, it, you know, I can feel it. Or if There's you're resistance. If you're, yeah, it's force that yeah. right. It's force displacing mass. It's literal power. It's watts. Right. You are to, to verify that something exists, you are searching for watts as a cross-reference. Okay, that must be real because when I poke it, it's there. If if your hand just went straight through that image, you're like, okay, that's that's a illusory thing. That's something mm -hmm. ethereal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so, yeah, you use that word very deliberately, right? When you, and so also like when you don't know if the experience that you're having is real, are you dreaming or are you not? Well, if in a, you're, when you're in a dream state, you're deprived of physical sensory input. So you, what do you do? You pinch yourself in your dream if you can. And if, and then that's maybe, but of course your brain could also produce false signals. And in fact, your brain is more, more likely to produce false signals. It's, it's very likely to make a false correlation. That's why we get, that's why like jump scares are so common in like movies. You know, we know for sure, we know that what we are seeing and it can like, do you ever get frustrated? Like when you're at a movie and you're just like, duh, and you're just like, damn it. <laughs> and you're always pissed at like jump scare movies. You know, for sure that you're just watching a story that like that thing isn't there right? But it'll jump and then you'll be like, Ugh! because your brain is like, well, ain't nobody got time to sort out between, to search for physical sensory inputs to determine if this is real or not, to react or not. Like, ain't nobody got time for that. Just assume it's real and react because it's a lot, you're mo much more likely to survive if you make a false positive correlation about that black mamba versus if you sit there and think about, you know, the nature of my abstract reality versus objective reality in order to respond. So like we're programmed right. to just assume it's real until you spend a lot more brain power to verify that it's not. 
this becomes extremely important in cyberspace because cyberspace is a dream state. Like I said, I don't know if you actually exist. I have no physical sensory inputs. I don't, I can't know if you're scarce. I can't know if you're decentralized because these are physical concepts. Um, and so if you want to, you know, what if we don't have a proof of real protocol in cyberspace, we have no way to know what's real and what isn't because there's no way to poke something or pinch something, no way to search for that power, power signal, then maybe it would be a good idea to produce a proof of power slash proof of real thing that we can transfer through cyberspace so that we know, okay, that thing must be real. Now I'd like to tell you about a great new Bitcoin show on the scene that you've got to check out. Brought to you by Swan Studios and Bitcoin Magazine, this show is Hard Money with Natalie Brunel. Natalie is an Emmy-nominated journalist bringing unparalleled experience to the Bitcoin media scene. And personally, Natalie is one of my favorite voices in the Bitcoin space. Each week on Hard Money, you'll get the top headlines of the week with analysis you won't find anywhere else. Hard-hitting interviews with amazing guests like myself and other top minds in the Bitcoin space. And the show will take you directly into the lives being changed by Bitcoin all over the world. Check out Hard Money at swan.com backslash hard money. Today, I wanna to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. So how does health insurance work? You send an egregious amount of money to an insurance company. They hold it in a pool of depreciating fiat currency. Then when you have a large health event, you have to pay them even more via your deductible, and then you hope they will cover your bill. And in fact, one in six bills are denied by healthcare.gov plans. It's time to take control of your own healthcare bills. I'd like to introduce you to CrowdHealth. It's a decentralization of healthcare using Bitcoin as an alternative to health insurance. Instead of sending fiat currency to a big corporation, you send that money to an account controlled by you, a portion of which is converted into Bitcoin. Then if you have a big health event, you have a community of Bitcoiners that will use the money in their accounts to help you out. To get more details, go to joincrowdhealth.com backslash breedlove, where you can find the promo code for $99 a month for six months. No, okay, you said it earlier, we didn't read the excerpt, but basically there's, an evolutionary advantage to seeing a vine, right? And mistaking it for a snake and just recoiling versus trying to actually process the thing and say, hey, is this actually a snake? Because your survival depends on staying away from snakes, obviously. Um, Peterson's talked about this. I think it's called the predator detection matrix. And he said there's there's lower levels of your brain that you can't you can't override them consciously. So if a snake strikes at you, you recoil. You can't consciously override the recoil to, to prevent it. And he tells this story of, I think it was Charles Darwin, actually, that was looking at a cobra in a glass box. And he would lean his face over to get close to the glass box. And when the cobra would strike, he would, he would always recoil. He was really trying to like override it to see if, you know, if he could do it. And he, he simply could not. Um, so it just speaks to the, I guess it's the Darwinian nature of all of this, right? That there are, there are systems running that the abstraction propositional knowledge layer does not have root access to. <laughs> there, are, there are primordial systems that we can't control. They're just kind of controlling us in a lot of ways. And also there are major evolutionary benefits to mistaking things that don't exist as physically real things mm -hmm. because it produces caution. You think you see a pattern. That's why you, right, right. It's like there were probably plenty of brains that weren't so quick to believe that something isn't real. And it's like, well, I mean, when that low probably chance that it really is a black mamba or really is a tiger staring at you, it's like, you didn't react fast enough. Right. So there are very clear benefits of being instinctively inclined to produce false positive correlations. And in Paleolithic, Paleolithic world, it's helpful. But 
as we become more agrarian, as society starts building these complex abstract constructs and mistaking things are physically real and they aren't, they make really stupid decisions like changing your proof of work system to a proof of stake system. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but but so so this is where we this is a what we've been talking about is what sapiens have been doing for like you know paleolithic paleolithic age their behavior changed dramatically when uh when we transitioned to the neolithic or kind of basically when people started when agriculture started and we've talked about like we just talked about how you talked about mirror neurons okay and i talked about how humans are instinctively disinclined to kill each other so let me make this point this is going to sound weird and like kind of kind of messed up but it's to illustrate a very clear point that i think is core to our understanding is this have you ever been fishing have you ever gone fishing yes okay have you ever cut the throat of a pig no have you ever cut the throat of a cow or a chicken? No. I can't, personally, I can't think of any time that I've ever actually killed the food that I eat with the exception of the fish. Mm -hmm. Okay, why do you think that is? Economic specialization. Do fish have eyelids? Do fish contort their faces when they feel pain? Do fish scream when they feel pain? Hmm. So the reason why I, so he, we're getting back to mirror neurons. The reason why that works is because mammals communicate the same way. We don't communicate through higher order syntactic and semantically complex language. We communicate through our eyes, you can tell when an animal is happy or not. You can tell when a cow is happy or not by, by virtue of their eyes. You can tell when they're in pain or not by virtue of their, their squints, their faces, their screams. We communicate, so it works both ways. That's why it's like kind of effed up. Like we communicate happiness the same way. We, what's the term called? No, no susception, detection of pain. We detect the feeling of pain the same way, hmm. right? Mammals do, or actually even, um, even animals, of different classes, except for fish, shellfish, and um, insects. They're capable of feeling pain, right? Their neuroreceptors on a, on, under a microscope look very similar to our pain receptors. They don't squint, they don't scream, they don't contort their faces. And so humans have no issue impaling them alive, disemboweling them alive, boiling them alive, squashing them alive, and showing all of these things on screen. But so isn't that interesting? Wow. Because domestication of animals. Okay, so somewhere along the lines of, let's call it 12,000 years ago, we started systematically enslaving and slaughtering animals. That's what domestication is, if you just, you know, and I'm not trying to be like sanctimonious or, or self-righteous here because I am the heir to a beef cattle farm. Like I, mm -hmm. I've thought a lot about this. I've sent a lot of cattle to the slaughter. And so there's this big anthropology, there's like this popular theory in anthropology that like we know for sure, like there's a reason why we're uncomfortable killing mammals and we're perfectly comfortable killing fish, shellfish, and insects. And when you start to systematically encage and trap, like modern civilization is, involves a lot of animal screaming, a lot of pigs and beef, or a lot of pigs and cows and chickens screaming, squinting eyeballs, showing pain. The, the anthropology theory is that because that's so, just like we justify the things that we instinctively feel through morals. We also have to find abstract justifications for going against our instincts. We are instinctively disinclined to cause suffering to other animals. Hmm. And so for us to systematically 
enslave, abuse, and slaughter them in an enormous scale to build modern civilization. We have to come up with abstract constructs to justify it because it's it's just too difficult to emotionally reconcile. And so that's why if you look at our fossil record, we we didn't start conceiving of humans being metaphysically transcendent, godlike against nature or above nature until at any meaningful scale until after we started domesticating animals. We had to believe that, an, that we're above nature, that animals exist to, to service us in order to justify the enormous discomfort of enslaving them and slaughtering them at such massive scale, which was necessary to support emerging city states. And you know, like, by the way, all domesticated animals are herbivores. You know why? Most of them, except for canine, except for wolves. Because, because we can feed them off their own slave labor. If you take an auric and you, and you, and you um, selectively breed them to be good, to be powerful and to pull a plow, you can plant a bunch of grain to feed more domesticated, domesticated herbivores. So like the reason why most domesticated animals are herbivores is so that we could feed them off their own slave labor th through, through the slave labor of the orcs that we whip and force to irrigate rainwatered land. So it's just a pure economic consideration. Yeah, yeah. And also because, oh, this gets into a later point, predators are quite capable of imposing physically prohibitive costs on us. Mm -hmm. You know, like... There's a reason why most people don't know what a lion tastes like, and but most people do know what a jungle fowl or a boar or a auric tastes like, mm. right? Um, it's hard to domesticate. It's hard to even encage proper apex predators um, because they're mean. <laughs> you yeah. have to, um, and so, I, so so after the emergence of agrarian society, this act of systemically oppressing animals, of starting to believe that we are above them through ideological, theological, or whatever means, then you start seeing signs of rank, signs of people's belief that some humans are above others. It's not a huge metacognitive leap to go from humans are godlike creatures above nature to some humans are godlike above other humans. And so you start to conceptualize of abstract things like rank and you can see it very clearly in our fossil record because in the paleo paleolithic age, when people were buried, they had essentially the same type of graves. Hmm. But as soon as agrarian society emerged, as soon as people started believing that in God Kings, hmm. you have just enormously, like most people have these like really shitty graves but then the rest of them have these, you know, some of them have just, just super exorbitant graves, just literally gold plated. Like you, you have to abstractly believe, and that happened after agriculture. So once you take the leap of believing we are, we're above nature, you start to believe we're above other humans. People start according, act according to that virtual reality, because there's nothing to indicate that the pharaohs were somehow meta, metaphysically superior to in fact, most of them there were inbred and incompetent. Like King Tut is was just like, I mean, he wasn't exactly like cream of the crop. Hmm. He was severely deformed because of inbreeding. In fact, many people of high rank throughout Neolithic, Bronze, Iron Age were quite deformed, right? Because of inbreeding, They're, right? Anyways, I digress. But the point is, humans started thinking of this concept called rank. Humans want to believe, humans are naturally disinclined to have to achieve pecking order through power because it involves having to risk injuring other people. We don't like to see, we don't like that feeling, it sucks. Mm. Um, and and you know, we know that humans are willing to die. They will, they're, they're instinctively like, for the Gettysburg example, but this experiment has been repeated, like humans very often will die before they shoot the person attacking them. You have, you have to train them out of that. Hmm. That's what militaries do. And so if we're willing to like die or risk death to avoid having to injure another human, 
then of course we're willing to accept abstract power hierarchies, which are demonstrably vulnerable to systemic exploitation and abuse to settle disputes, to manage control over resources, to determine the legitimate state of chain of custody of our property. Just because of that sheer not wanting to have to hurt each other to do it, like right. virtually all other pack, pack, pack animals do. Um, and to your point, because it's more economically efficient, because it's more energy efficient. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so, so interesting. Uh, so these abstract power hierarchies, you know, I guess we could call them stories too, right? Or virtual reality, symbolic structures. They are these programmed systems we inhabit, right? And like you said earlier about LARPing and role-playing, in that system, everyone fills a certain role, right? And But that role there has to be a shared belief about that role. Like you, whatever, you're, you're at the top of the hierarchy, you're at the bottom. So there's, there's an understanding there. And so this whole idea of the collective imagination, like it's always been with us, right? These virtual realities precede what we now call virtual reality, obviously. And I guess cyberspace is kind of like the new forum for the, for this collective imagination to express itself. And it is maybe that, it explains why we're in such disarray today like people we're just trying to come to terms with this new substrate for the collective imagination shared abstract realities where humans start to operate under this imaginary belief that other humans have higher rank and by virtue of abstract ideas believe that it's somehow morally superior to use abstract rank to settle disputes and do all the things established pecking order. They started that behavior thousands of years before they had written language, before they were formally codified into what we now call rules of law. So abstract power hierarchies, beliefs in God kings, centralized command and control over resources as some type of ideologically morally superior way of establishing pecking order over resources that existed thousands of years before we just used our syntactically and semantically complex higher order language to formally codify that. Because like written language is only 5,000 years old, but we were operating as centralized city states at least 7,500 years ago, but we were agrarian societies showing signs of beliefs and abstract power at least 10,000 years ago. Mm. And so what um, cyberspace is, this is jumping ahead a little bit into my next chapter, but like computers are at least 2,500 years old. Like we had Greek astrolabes. A computer is a state machine. It's a machine that takes a discrete state, a mathematically discrete state, one or zero, based off of inputs that you put into it. So and, and you use that to compute things. So it's named after its function, not after its form. Because the form changes constantly. Mm -hmm. But the function of computing things, specifically mathematically discrete states, has been around for a long time. And then only, only until like the 1800s did we start to conceive of general purpose computers. So for like 2,400 years, can, uh, discrete state machines could only be used to solve specific problems. They could not be used for general purpose. So you didn't have general purpose computers. Mm -hmm. uh, what's his face and conceived of the analytical engine that could, could uh, a machine, a very complicated machine, mechanical machine that could do general purpose computing, but it was so freaking complicated and expensive that it would never, was never built. But just based off of the designs, people started to write programs for it. So like, if you pull this lever and do this sequence, you can calculate whatever it was Ada Lovelace calculated. It was like the, um, it's like a Fibonacci sequence or something. Ada Lovelace was someone in the mid 1800s who took the design of the analytical engine, the first design of a general Babbage? purpose computer. Babbage, yeah, Babbage, yeah, thank you. Yeah. But his, his machine was never built, but that's okay. You can still program a machine that doesn't exist if you have the design stuff for it. And so when, when Ada Lovelace published 
the set of instructions, the math, she was a mathematician, the set of instructions which tells a discrete state machine what mathematically discrete state to take. When she published that, she was technically the first computer programmer. And then it wasn't until like the 1930s where we actually got to a point where you, it was feasible to actually build the thing. And it was just because at that point we had like electromechanical solenoids that could do the state switching instead of like really complex, difficult to, to machine um, mechanical pieces. But I say all that because people forget that like, oh, well actually let's not, let's continue going further. So you can have a semi-electric general purpose computer. And the first one was the Mark I by, um, was it IBM? I can't remember, but it was hot. It was, it's here. We can, you, you can go visit if you want to come to Harvard or to come to Boston, but it was deployed at Harvard. So a, a general purpose computer that's like half electric, half mechanical, it's like electromechanical. Um, it was still used for very specific functions, even though it was technically a general purpose computer. As soon as it was built, it was confiscated by this guy named John von Neumann for the secret project, very mysterious project. So like they built this big thing, it took seven years to build it. And like this guy shows up, this Austrian guy, and is like, I'll take it from here. And he starts to manually program it, right? So you had to pull levers and punch buttons and literally replug wires to, to, to program this thing, to give it in the instructions it needs to, uh, to calculate the state. And then like a couple of years after that, uh, the US Army commissioned the first ever fully electric general purpose computer, deployed that. It was originally intended to build um, artillery tables for the army. So like one of these computers could replace 2,500 people calculating a bunch of, like it was like, it's enormously more, I almost said more good. It was a lot better at calculating discrete mathematical states, right? But of course, what happens, John von Neumann po pops up day one that it's actually built. It's like, I'll take it from here. <laughs> I'll, I'm gonna work on this for my mysterious project. Okay, but as he was working on that, his project became a lot less serious as the US president said, we just bombed here or she or we um, said, you know, it, basically word got out that we had invented the atomic bomb. And so the first general purpose computers, operational general purpose computers were used, the first programs that were run on those things were used to design the atomic bomb. And John von Neumann was writing like very popular computer programs like merge sort as he was working on the Manhattan Project. And you can see it where he erased top secret off of it because he was like, actually, this could, be, this could be a lot more useful for other things besides just designing the detonator for atomic weapons. Anyways, I say all that because John von Neumann, it took days for him to program these computers to calculate his atomic bomb design. Like it took forever to program these things. And so him and his buddies came up with the idea. It's like, what if we could figure out a way to convert computer programming instructions to convert something based on mass to a soft form? We can convert kinetic instructions to electric instructions. We could figure out a way to convert instructions into states themselves, digits. And then we could invent a memory organ is what he called it, for a computer where you can store the instructions to operate it on the computer itself and it will operate according to its own operating instructions that we digitally stored in electronic memory. And so he and his buddies were writing to you know, the United States Army and saying like, hey, I think we could design a general purpose store program computer where we convert kinetic programming actions into electric signals Right? We convert mass displacing or forces displacing mass to charges passing across resistors. And then we could do that. And then we could design those programs in the abstract domain where there is no mass, where there is no physical thing. And so like I had to quote somewhere, he says, it's easy to see by formal logical methods that there exist codes that are in abstracto adequate to control and cause the execution of any sequence of operations. 
available in the machine and which are in their entirely entirety conceivable by the program by the problem planner. So he's starting to conceive of this idea that's like, if we create general purpose stored program computers, we can, there might be no limit beyond the limits of the machine to what we could design this to do. He was basically like realizing and telling the army, software is gonna be a big thing. <laughs> this idea of software, this idea of manually programming or of, of giving instructions to a state machine Right. I, I say all that because software does not exist, Robert. <laughs> it's an idea. Yeah. It's a, it, you know, it's a code that we think of in abstracto because our brains are not wired to think about literal ones and zeros. Our brains are wired to think of semantically and syntactically complex, meaningful ideas. And so we choose to abstract what are just instructions that tells a state machine what to do as something other than ones and zeros binary code because we're uh, we have because 80 percent of our brain is neocortex and we are just hardwired for abstract thinking and, and and just like you can trace the different applications of abstract thought across the the paleolithic age you can you can trace it across the last 80 years of humans coming up with increasingly more complex abstractions to explain the complex emergent behavior of this thing that we call software. And that all leads into this thing that we call cyberspace. Cyberspace does not exist, not physically. Cyberspace is a thing that exists only within our imaginations. It is just a bunch of discrete state machines storing electric signals on, on the machine. And then we have programmed that to look like images, to look, to list, to sound like images, to mm -hmm. present the same syntactically and syntactically, semantically and syntactically complex language that we are used to seeing. So we we're forcing computers to use the same language that we do so that we can talk to them and understand them as, as we already talk and understand to each other. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it, I love, <laughs> I, the, the explanation you gave of Lovelace writing imaginary programs for an imaginary computer, because it didn't really exist yet physically at least, yeah. but all of that imaginal play preceded the actual physical computer as we understand it. By a century. So we were programming computers and writing software a century before we had general purpose computers that could actually run them. Right. So that's like the perfect little vignette for how integral the imaginal space is to our relationship with physical reality. Right. It, it, it really is the human superpower, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, you know, cyberspace is just part of our imagination. It's pretty incredible to think about because we always think of it as a real thing. Right. But ultimately we're just engaging with these some, again, symbolic structures that are, being forced to render things that are, you know, perceptible to us and understandable by us. And I, I guess the, the problem there, the, what we lack in cyberspace was the proof of real, right? Exactly. We, we didn't have, there's no real physical constraint in that domain. And so you, it, whatever, it's flooded with bullshit. <laughs> Weaponized misinformation now. Yeah. Unless there's some mechanism that reconciles it to physical reality, which is... Proof of work. As you guys may have guessed. <laughs> proof of work but, and Bitcoin. But this problem already existed 7,500 years ago, right? Because we had already created an abstract virtual reality, which says God King is above other, king, other people. So we already created an abstract power hierarchy. We started behaving according to this abstract. We started operating according to this abstract power hierarchy. And then over and over and over again, whether we formally codified that abstract power hierarchy using written language or not, they kept on becoming systemically exploitive, exploitative. They kept on being abused. We kept on reaching oppressive states where God Kings had enormous asymmetric uh, control over resources than other people. And just because people believe that they're powerful, right? The enforcers would act like they're powerful, so they would LARP and kind of try to 
hypostatize or you know try to act according as if like that physical that abstract power was real when it's not really they're just acting ex post facto and we do all this stuff and so what so not only is cyberspace just a continuation of abstract reality which is no different than the abstract reality which has existed for the last 10,000 years the only difference is the manner in which we formally codify it using computer programs versus writing rules on a piece of parchment and calling that the rule of law. The, just like, you know, that's essentially the same. You once again have God Kings emerging. You've got God Kings rising up and saying, there is some, something abstract, this abstract form of power, we call it stake. And if you, uh, and if you use stake, this abstract form of power, to manage control over your resources, to, to uh, achieve consensus on the legitimate state and chain of custody of your, of your property, to settle disputes. If you use this abstract for, source of power, it will achieve the same level of security as physical power. When we have seven, at least 7,500 years to prove that anytime anyone has ever tried to create an abstract power hierarchy to manage resources, it has turned abusive, it has turned exploitative, and it has led to war. War did not exist. The massive scales wars, wars that did not exist until after sapiens started acting like they were above other sapiens and fighting for control over resources. So it's like this ultimate tragedy where we, we believe that it is somehow morally or ethically better to use abstract power as the basis to manage our pecking order. And so we believe in abstract power, not in, 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 because it's better, because it uses less injury, it causes less, or it uses less energy, it causes less injury. We believe that's better. We create entire resources control hierarchies dependent on that, only to become abused and exploited and oppressed at levels which never existed before, and only to have to eventually settle that the messy way so we've never escaped from our, the, the existential necessity to use physical power, which is what warfare means, because abstract power is very physically different and very systemically different. There is abstract power is inherently inegalitarian. Not everyone mm -hmm. can have it, right? Mm -hmm. Rank, not everyone can have rank. Rank is inherently zero sum, so it's bounded. Just like state. So like, yep, so there is, so that's the problem, right? Because if you need, if you become oppressed, you need access to this thing. If you use watts, there is no limit to the amount of watts that you can use to impose a cost on your attackers. So like honest people have access to theoretically unlimited watts to defend themselves, but stake is zero sum. Okay, same, same deal with rank and abstract power hierarchies. Their stake and rank are virtually the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. um, what, are, what are some other systemic differences? Uh, obviously rank, cannot impose is not physically real so it can't be verifiably physically decentralized right. you can try to create voting systems to ostensibly decentralize it but voting systems themselves are extremely prone to and well known prone to uh systemic exploitation and abuse right regulatory they capture they also don't ground out in physical reality they're unrepresentative so like yes. for example less than a thousand people in the united states determine the laws of more than 330 million people. So we, we ostensibly have a representative democracy, but it ain't, that ain't statistically representative, not right. when it's 0 0.0001 of the population gets determined the rules for everyone else. Right. But of course, we can't do it otherwise because that would be too morally bad, right? We, it would be it's, it's through ideology. And, and I'm not like trying to, well, like this is a known problem. The people who invented voting systems were affluent white males, right? Okay, who deliberately didn't let other people vote. <laughs> like the, trace inequality to abstract power hierarchies, especially voting systems, and you will see very clear correlations between, you know, these types of issues. This this type of systemic exploitation, which necessarily must be resolved through real world physical power if you want to fix the state of exploitation. Right. Because if you want to secure yourself, it ain't through something which doesn't exist like abstract power, like rank or stake. Right. If you want to achieve real world systemic security, then the only way to do that is to make your benefit to cost ratio attack 
small. Mm -hmm. So there's the benefit to, to attacking you and there's the cost to attacking right. you. It's a simple equation. Right? Take that denominator and make that as big as possible. Make it as painful as you possibly can to attack you using as yes. much physical power in as clever as way. And you will magically never have to face these levels of systemic oppression. This is not something that is even arguable because we have plenty of data to get causal inference off of this. You eat that causal inference for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner yes. when you eat bacon and right. when you eat chicken and when you yes. eat like domestication is A-B testing experience experiments. We take wild animals and then we remove their capacity, their physical aggression and capacity to project power. And then they become easy to exploit. They become easy to slaughter. They become docile. They become far less capable of being free. Mm -hmm. And so that's not like a, that's not like one of those things where it's like, oh, well, correlation doesn't necessarily cause that, um, imply causation. Well, A-B testing and experimentation and multiple data sets that are repeatable across multiple different species does give causal inference. We know for sure that if you make an animal less inclined to be physically uh, aggressive, they will be less free. They're more exploitable. They're much more exploitable. And so yes. that's a problem because what does rule of law do? Rule of law by ideological means says right. physical power, physical aggression, it just not just rule of law, just philosophy in general says mm -hmm. it's bad to kill each other to establish control authority over resources. It's like, okay, don't be surprised when Mr. God King comes along and exploits the crap out of you. And, and you, you can trace throughout the Neolithic all the way to modern ages, they started super oppressive and because of a whole bunch of bloodshed became less physically oppressive. So like America is a beautiful demonstration of this, right? We got to the point where we were, we escaped our um, state of systemic exploitation. How? By killing thousands of redcoats is how, by imposing right. real world severe physical prohibitive costs on the abstract power hierarchy, which was uh, oppressing them. So as much as we want to condemn your military for causing injury, or as much as we want to condemn your hashing infrastructure for its energy intensity, no one over the last 10,000 years has ever been able to replicate the systemic security features of using watts to impose a physically prohibitive cost on people who might attack you. We can create all kinds of abstractions and imaginary worlds that we can formally codify either through rules of law or through computers, but it doesn't work because if it worked, there would be no such thing as warfare. Mm -hmm. There would be no need for physical power at all. And, and like, obviously this is true because look at nature, look at the animals, which can't think abstractly, look what they do. Look at how they're like, Robert, I got, I've got sharp teeth here. I got mm -hmm. these sharp incisors. It's like that. I, that ain't for, you know, eating leaves, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> like I am a predator. That's why I have no problem saying, yeah, we do kind of murder animals at massive scale to, yeah. to get our steak, but it's like, I'm a predator and that's what you I'm really, I'm really good at it. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry. If but... Yeah, it sounds ethically bad, perhaps, but I think that grounds out in what you said earlier about the emotionality of certain animals that we can see that. But ultimately, in this universe, life feeds on life. I mean, you can't, you can be upset about it and you can, you know, I don't know, become a vegan or whatever, but even then you're feeding on life. It's just a, a different kind of life. So Okay. Yeah, it's just, it's just a cautionary tale about being too quick to condemn the use of physical power to secure things, to settle right. disputes, to determine resource control, to come to consensus about the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody and property. We shouldn't be so quick to condemn the use of physical power just because it's highly energy intensive or just because it is prone to causing physical injury because nature proves that's what's best for survival yes. that's why we find powerful people attractive right intelligent people attractive because they're quite good at this right that's why pack animals do sexual bimorphism and optimize for power projection 
That's why, despite every attempt that sapiens have ever tried to instantiate something other than a physical power-based resource control hierarchy, it has resulted in massive scale war, massive scale systemic abuse, exploitation, and oppression. By, by saying power is bad and ethically bad, we're actually causing ourselves systemically to slaughter right. each other at way higher scales than any other animal and even, even our own sapiens did 10,000 years ago. Right. <laughs> and that's what Bitcoin solves. Yes. Because the problem isn't the use of physical power to establish resource control over. Because we can't replace it. We've tried. Right. Right. What Bitcoin does is say, okay, it, it acknowledges, I accept that there is no way that you can achieve the complex emergent behavior in terms of security as physical power can. I accept that any form of abstract power cannot achieve the same complex emergent behavior, okay? But at the very least, we can make it electric. We can take the mass mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. We can generate power using charge across resistor and we can, we can achieve something that doesn't cause physical injury. And we, we get to a point, sorry. Stake is regression. We're right there. Mm -hmm. We are so close to figuring it out and scaling this at globally and to go back to the world of stake, to go back to this belief that the use of physical power to establish pecking order is bad just because it uses injury. It is so scary and it's so sad because God, we, we're just right there. It just, right. all it will take is a couple more people to see it. And we could dramatically restructure human society and escape from this agrarian prison that we've been in for the last 10,000 years. Hmm. But you can't condemn the use of Watts. You can't condemn people who use physical power. And so when I get all this shit on Twitter for being part of the active military and when people shit all over you know, the, the, you know, the military industrial complex, it's like, you don't understand from a systemic, um, systemic perspective, you're making the same anti proof of work argument that proof of stake people do. And it's like, how can I figure out a way to actually explain this in a, in a way that people um, can understand so that we don't, because like the alternative is war. Mm -hmm. There is no replacement for physical power for settling right. disputes in a fair way, in a meritocratic way. There is will never be a replacement for physical power for determining resources control over or control authority over resources. There is no replacement for physical power for achieving fair consensus on the legitimate state chain of custody of any form of property. Mm -hmm. There are no replacements. We've tried and it never works. It's demonstrably it's a demonstrable failure. So you can try it again through proof of stake and just give this abstract power to a bunch of anonymous people who will exploit you because we have 5,000 years of written testimony that says anytime an abstract power hierarchy is formally codified into a set of rules, it becomes exploitative and abusive. Or you can just take the mass out of the physical power and you can make it non-lethal and you can make it incapable of causing in injury and usher in a completely new world of, of you know, of agrarian society where our base layer form of consensus is something which is incapable of causing injury. It, it, it's an extraordinarily um, beautiful idea, but, you know, we just keep on making the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, uh, beautifully said. Um, I, power is the proof, right? It's the only acceptable form of proof ultimately that energy has to be moved across time. Otherwise it's not being proven, right? It's not, it has to, has to ground out in the real as, as we're saying here. So yeah, man, I, I hear you. And it, it, it's, it, it's twofold. There's like two versions. There's two functions of power. One is systemic security for all the reasons I'm talking about, but the other one is what we talked about before, which is proof of real. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cyberspace has both problems. It is very obvious that be because of the emergence of cyberspace, that sapiens are experiencing a metacognitive crisis. We don't know what real is. We don't know 
right? Not through cyberspace. Mm -hmm. So we have the weaponization of misinformation. We've got these new abstract power hierarchies emerging, which can just control us and exploit us in ways that we could never have predicted through their use of information, right? These new things are forming. All these new god kings are emerging, trying to kind right. of get their, get their new empire in this abstract reality. And the solution to that is the solution is the same solution for both. Like if you want to know what's real, you pinch it, you look, you search for power, right. right? If you want to know what is true information, at least if you want to physically constrain the transfer of misinformation, right. or if make, you want make to- Make the signal costly, right? That's what proof of Then make does. it costly and post physical costs. And so when you see things like Michael Saylor saying, we need to adopt a, um, what was it? The orange check. Mm -hmm. what he's saying is we need to impose a real world physical cost on the transfer of information through cyberspace that will cut that will if you make you can make it microscopic right so such that you know a normal living person is uh it's like inconsequential to them the amount of bitcoin they have to yeah. post as collateral just like it cost us energy metabolic energy to speak but not much right yeah yeah but for uh, you know, a bot farm or for thousands of bot farms sending out millions of tweets constantly, yeah. it will be too physically cost prohibitive. So yeah. the problem is people think, so you mentioned gunpowder earlier. Hmm. For, for two centuries, people thought gunpowder was medicine. Hmm. They, they monetized it as medicine. They traded it as medicine. Um, why? Why do you think that was, Robert? No idea. It was because the inventor called it called it medicine. <laughs> it was because the inventor intended to build medicine. He was a doctor. So for centuries, people thought black powder was medicine for no other reason than its inventor intended to build medicine and called it medicine. So given all that we've said about the abstractions of software, what is Bitcoin? Is it a coin? Is it just a coin? So if you view People who, people who think Bitcoin is a coin are just accepting an abstraction as true for no other reason than the inventor called it a coin, called it money, the paid to pure cash, and for no other reason than the inventor intended to build it. But like you can call, call the receipt of solving a hash cost function anything you want. Like we talked about last time, Adam Back originally called it a stamp. Mm -hmm. It would be stupid to go to the United States Department of Treasury and ask their technical input about the technical merits of, of Bitstamp. Mm -hmm. Just like it would be silly to go to a meteorologist and ask him about the technical merit of that thing that stores our emails called clouds. Mm -hmm. Just like it would be, um, you know, it, so why do we listen to like bankers talk about the technology, technical merits of Bitcoin just because it's a coin? Right, because it was just arbitrarily called a coin because that's what its inventor called it and what it intended to build, and because it doubles as a great money. You know what mm -hmm. double as a great money, Robert? Physi real world physical power transferable mm -hmm. through cyberspace. The ability, right? Yes. That would be super awesome money because it's super secure right. money, right? It, it, so, so you can just so just stop calling it money for a second. Okay, it sound what when Michael Saylor says, okay, it's an it's a what it, it sounds like Michael Saylor is describing a paywall, which is why people get pissed off. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, you're just doing a paywall. It's like stop calling it money, call it physical, call it cyber power, real world cyber power. If you demand people say you can't post a tweet or you can't spam a bunch of crap unless you post Bitcoin or a cyber power as collateral, what you are technically doing to them in shared objective reality is imposing a real world physical cost on them. You are making it too physically cost prohibitive to spam. That's mm -hmm. why Adam Back invented the cost function specifically for spam, but it, that's not the only way, that's not the only thing it can defend against. Right. And so we are now in this like world where holy crap, Bitcoin is cyber power. We can use it. We can invent protocols to, to secure ourselves by imposing physical costs on people. 
who try to deny our access to property, to, to try to systemically exploit our, our policy. And we can actually start to use this bad boy to overturn the massive state of exploitation and oppression that is current cyberspace. Hmm. Cyberspace is a huge abstract power hierarchy with people with egregious levels of asymmetric control over others, ability to weaponize misinformation, ability to exploit people in ways that we could never imagine. And we now have this medicine mm -hmm. to balance the scales. And just like in physical objective reality, the amount of power that you have matters. Like if you, you know, more powerful militaries are able to, sh you know, control more and more resources and have more agency and freedom than the ones that aren't. The same is going to play out in cyberspace, right? It, your ability to, I guess what I'm saying is buy as much Bitcoin as possible because <laughs> if it's cyber power, right? Michael Saylor is going to be his own military, essentially. Like he's going right. to be as powerful and more powerful than nation states in terms of his agency and freedom of action in from through cyberspace. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's so many good points there. And I would just, as you're saying that, it you know, money is often equated to power, at least as a proxy for power. And it's fascinating to me that obviously we describe Bitcoin as money, but there is there's a deeper element to it that you know, money itself lives at the nexus of abstract and physical power, political and physical power in a way, right? It's it's approved by the political apparatus, but it also like with gold, it was grounded in this physical power proof of work thing. And, and it's just so fascinating that um, gold, the connections there, but gold was physically constrained. Yes. Right. And so that's physical why constraints. it was ultimately politically accepted. Okay. And so what happened when we switched off gold, we removed the physical constraints. Well, yes. Yes. The people in charge of the abstract imaginal power hierarchy wanted to throw off the shackles of proof of work gold in the same way that Vitalik is trying to throw off the yoke of proof of work now. Yeah. So to He's... try and bring this somewhat full circle, perhaps post-merge Ethereum proof of stake is an imaginal structure that's irreconcilable to reality now, right? It doesn't have proof of work. There's no way to reconcile it to reality. So if it can't reconcile the reality, then inevitably it's going to diverge. And so this is the rise of the God King, right? The, the Vitalik God King trying to be uh, in charge of his little imaginary hierarchy. But with the emergence of this irreconcilable hierarchy come massive incentives to defect because there are people are being sucked into this thing or they're joining this thing voluntarily, whatever, but they're being exploited, right? You're being exploited. If you're in proof of stake and you're not one of the early miners or founders or pre-miners or whatever, you're not on top of the heap. You're basically being exploited over time, right? That's what proof of stake does. It's centralizing power and wealth in the system. So those that are being, um, let's say dispossessed in that hierarchy, right? They're not getting the power and wealth. They're not benefiting from the proof of stake system. The incentives for them to defect are growing, which is to say, you know, this is the essence of game theory. I want to minimize my losses and I want to be unexploitable. Well, if I'm in this participating in this POS system, well, I'm getting exploited and my losses are <laughs> stacking up. So with, with the accretion of those two things come my incentive to defect. And so does that mean that that's the ultimate, if we have to speculate about the demise of proof of stake, does it just fork itself to death? Like all these people try to defect and start their own little God King hierarchy and it just dissolves or like, where, where do you, I think you've made a pretty strong case that proof of stake doesn't work. And we've, we've beaten it up a lot over a lot of episodes. There's also the, the Bible verse that I read at one point that kind of sums it up. So like proof of stake in our own little abstract virtual reality here, it's not going to work in the real world. How do you think it fails? When you take wild animals and you remove their capacity to cause severe physically prohibitive costs on their attackers, 
they become docile, they become weak, they become extremely easy to exploit, they become able lambs to the slaughter, they worship their masters, and it turns out ugly. So we know for sure that when you remove a group, a, a population's capacity to be physically aggressive, AKA to impose severe physical prohibitive costs in Watts, they become systemically vulnerable. Repeat that for agrarian society. When God kings, when kings, when people use their rhetoric to convince people to forfeit their physical aggression, to forfeit their capacity to impose severe mm. physical costs on attackers using Watts, they become systemically exploited, they become oppressed. That oppression reaches a state of severity that people become willing to accept the energy expenditure and the risk of injury to reset the control authority. And that's what a war is. Or a revolution even. Or yeah. so a revolutionary yeah. war. So if yeah. It, yeah. So, so the end state for the last at least 7,500 years of every time people have used rhetoric to try to replace the systemic security features of physical power using an abstract form of power, it backfires. It leads directly to war. It mm -hmm. leads directly to energy expenditure and injury at scales which never existed before the emergence of abstract power hierarchies and morally superior alternatives. Mm. So re regardless of whether you decide to formally codify that abstract power hierarchy and that control structure through laws, through parchment, or through Python, or through some program, the end state is war. The, well, I guess I should say the end state is exploitation and abuse and oppression at such massive scale that people eventually learn to accept physical power mm. as and so the end state of proof of stake is Bitcoin, right? right? Eventually people are going to achieve a state of systemic oppression, of systemic exploitation and abuse that they are going to concede. And they're going to admit that there is no physical, there is no replacement for physical power. There never has been a replacement for physical power. There never will be a replacement for physical power in terms of its ability to achieve the complex emergent behavior of proper systemic security. Hmm. So it will break, it won't break. It'll behave exactly as it's designed to behave as all, as we have 5,000 years of written testimony to say it behaves. And then they'll just figure it out. But it's like, just just buy bitcoin now <laughs> just, <yeah. laughs> like you we like the amount of suffering that is going to happen if the world if if our like before it actually brought me to tears be because of how sad it makes me we have an opportunity here to fix this you just have to acknowledge there is no replacement for physical power and you have to stop being so sanctimonious and self-righteous and using rhetoric and ideolo ideologies to justify not using mm. physical power when it's very clear that there is no replacement for it for achieving mm. security. Mm. If you want to be secure, increase your cap capacity to impose severe physical costs in watts mm. on other people who would try to deny your access to your property or who would try to exploit your policy. And by the way, it doesn't have to be kinetic. It doesn't have to be lethal. We can do this non-lethally. We can do this peacefully. We can do this in a way that's actually supportive of infrastructure, that actually develops infrastructure. You just have to get off your sanctimony. Stop mm. villainizing. Stop condemning physical power because it always backfires. Mm. You're just shooting yourself in the foot. Mm. You're a fool if you believe that there is a way to achieve the same level of systemic security as Watts. So when Vitalik and all these other new God Kings start to try to convince people that there is a way that it's morally reprehensible to spend Watts to defend yourself, we read history. It's all there. We know exactly how it's gonna play out. You go to, you either go to hard war 
where you settle this asymmetry and, and abuse through kinetic power projection, or we go to soft war where we do it through Bitcoin. And I have a feeling that nations and people are going to overwhelmingly desire the soft form of physical power. Mm -hmm. And so the end state of, like I said before, the end state of everything, not, but it's not just proof, of, it's not just like Ethereum, the end state of the act of people using abstract power to determine the legitimate state and chain of custody and establish control authority and all the settled disputes is Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So like this will transform the way nation states, um, you know, operate, especially like through, um, through economic means, through financial means, but it's not just going to be limited to financial. Yeah. I, so physical power is true everywhere that energy flows across time, which is everywhere so far as we can tell. And we need to submit ourselves to that truth to be free rather than trying to submit ourselves to the will of any individual, right? Or any aggregate of willpower, just fiat, you know, fiat or this idea of being told what to do. It doesn't work. Yeah. You, you, it's trust-based. Trust doesn't work. Yeah. The root problem of all trust doesn't scale. agrarian society, of all abstract power hierarchies, of all of these things that we call peace, to borrow a phrase from someone pretty smart is the root cause of all those systems is people must be trusted. Mm -hmm. And history is filled with examples of breaches of that trust. If you yeah. use anything but physical power, the systemically exogenous, unbounded, fully inclusive, what may be the only meritocracy in shared objective reality. Thermodynamics. Yeah, so, so it made sense 10,000 years ago, 7,500 years, it makes sense to not want to use, like I'm not, you know, arguing that we should go back to anarchy where everyone fights over every sandwich. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, recognize the systemic security flaws of rules of law and abstract power hierarchies, recognize that they always end up in warfare yeah. because there ain't no replacement for physical power. Because they're And recognize, yeah, and, 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 uh, th thing is like people think that um, safety hazards or the enormous amount of loss associated with war is due to a linear chain of events. So A cause B cause C. And so the problem with that is the, the, the dude in uniform, the, the me or my peers, we're always going to be the, the last thing in the chain of events preceding the human casualties. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're always going to be able, if you want to be lazy and attribute loss and, and problems to militaries, what you're doing is you're saying losses and accidents and hazards happen as a linear chain of events. And the last thing in the sequence of events that caused the, the death and destruction was the militaries, therefore militaries are bad. That's a, that's a lazy way of looking at security. That's a lazy way of looking at safety or, or any hazard. The proper way to look at it is to think of it systemically. What are the properties what are the things that are causing and motivating the return to massive scale warfare to resettle disputes? Mm -hmm. And that is the use of abstract power. That is yes. humans right. hubris. Yes. We think that we right. can find an alternative means to physical power, right. but we can't. So if we can't, then the next best thing is to at least make it non-lethal, to accept the fact that it will, it will burn energy. And just be like, okay, we accept that because at least it's not killing people. And so like proof of work is the moral equivalent. If you choose to believe in morality, that abstract construct, mm -hmm. proof of work is the equivalent to war, except instead of hard war, just like, you know, hardware, we take the mass out of it and we make soft war. So we just make war soft and you can achieve the same level of systemic security, but without the without the hazards. And I'm not saying that will like, you know, eliminate warfare altogether because so long as we have things with mass property with mass, we're mm -hmm. still going to need kinetic power to secure them. But much of the reason why we fight is not because of mass is not because of, of the resources themselves. It's control authority over the resources, right? Right. Humans started doing massive scale warfare after they 
started establishing rank and abstract based control authority over the resources. So when Sargon goes around capturing city states, he's not actually into, he doesn't really actually give a shit about the grain and the farms. He wants control authority over the farms. Mm -hmm. So the main reason people fight is for control authority over resources, not for the actual things. So what if you make that control authority? And what if, you know, what if you take, what if you use electricity to establish that control authority, which is mm -hmm. what Bitcoin does. Right. Like if everyone uses Bitcoin as the base layer collateral for all mass-based resources, then implicitly and tacitly, the control authority over those mass-based resources is largely now can be decentralized and fought over through Bitcoin. Um, that doesn't completely replace it because I can still always just like freaking capture people and shoot them and take their stuff, mm -hmm. at least physical resources. But like we said in other and other arguments that that fight has already reached its its shelling point and it's um like that fight is already stalemated right as long as nuclear weapons exist there will be no strategic level invasions and warfare because if there were we wouldn't exist anymore so like so we don't have to worry about that um we have to worry about you know uh it, you know nuclear just like Holocaust basically, yeah. but so long as nuclear Holocaust doesn't happen and we don't start going to strategic level nuclear warfare, then for the most part, control authority over our physical land is pretty much settled. And then now the next thing is, okay, well, how do we achieve control authority over everything else, which is what's gonna be solved through cyberspace, through, through base layer collateral networks, which is what Bitcoin represents. So. The future of cybersecurity is the future of national security. The soup, it's, um, it's a big deal. We should probably take this very seriously. And for the love of God, get these people who, the last people qualified to talk about this type of technology is the United States Treasury Reserve. The last people qualified to talk about it is the United States Federal, or sorry, the, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. The people who think Bitcoin is just money are right. not the people to be qualified to be talking about the national strategic impl implications right. of this. Yeah. Just like it wasn't, maybe it was true. I don't know if you've ever had it, but I've personally never eaten black powder before. So if, if you, know, you went to a doctor in the first 200 years after black powder was invented and those doctors tell them this is a terrible form of medicine, they could be correct. They may absolutely be correct that this may not be a good form of medicine. But it wouldn't be a good idea to let them run the policy on the use of black powder. It wouldn't be smart to take their technical expertise on black powder, assuming that it's strictly a medicine. Right. So we need to get this thing, this power projection technology where people are using a wholly new form of watts to impose severe physical prohibitive costs on other people for the sake of defending and securing their their property for the sake of protecting their rules against systemic exploitation abuse. We need to stop looking towards these bankers who have no idea what they're talking about because they're way out of their lane here. Mm -hmm. They are not qualified to be talking about the national strategic implications of this technology. People who are qualified to talk about it are people who've been spending their entire lives studying how to use watts to impose physically prohibited costs on other people. And in, in my particular case, figuring out how to do that in new domains like space. Those are the people who are, should, you should at least be talking to, uh -huh. to get their inputs. And, and anytime a new power projection technology emerges, the cat's out of the back, it never goes back in the right. back. So when gunpowder is invented, it's never going back in the back. When airplanes are invented, it's never going back in the back. When torpedoes are invented, it's never going back in the back. Right. Right? When nukes are invented, it's never going back in the bag. So adapt or die. So when Bitcoin's invented, it ain't going back in the bag. You have to choose how you're going to react to this. Mm. And if I'm right, which I don't know if I am, the point of publishing this theory is to at least get it out there and get other people's inputs. I could be wrong and I couldn't make myself look like an ass. But the consequences of being wrong and loud are way less than the consequences of being right and quiet. So I have to get this out there. If I'm right, then the national strategic priority is to stock as much as a cyber power as possible, to drive the price of it as high as you can, to be as accommodative and supportive to the hashing infrastructure 
to, to a preferably a commercially decentralized hacking in infrastructure as possible, because we are going into a new world where people are going to be able to impose physical prohibitive costs on each other in front through cyberspace for way more reasons than just protecting their purchasing power. power. If you choose to, to make this cyber power money, if you choose to treat it as money, which is what we're starting to do. And um, yeah, so I'm right here. If anyone's watching, um, I'm ready to help shape policy and help policymakers actually understand how to react to this thing that we know for sure that anytime any new power projection technology emerges, like when gunpowder did, or like when Emperor Constantine turned down Orban the engineer who offered him to build a cannon, or when the UK turned down whatever his name was, Whitehead, when he offered to build the UK Navy torpedoes, like our own government disenfranchised Billy Mitchell and pumped all the money into to, uh, battleships only to have Pearl Harbor happen. Billy Mitchell is the dude, like a founding father of the Air Force. Mm. He kept on like screaming at, at policymakers that like airplanes are going to be a big deal and our new power projection technology and you need to be pumping your money to buying as many airplanes and maturing airplane development before you start pumping it towards battleships. Right. And this was ha happened like a decade before Pearl Harbor. The shelling point, shelling point it, shifts. You have, to, yeah. you have to embrace it or suffer the consequences. Yeah, this is this is nature. Welcome to the basics of survival and primordial economics and, and the way natural selection has worked for the last four billion years. Yes, exactly. The culmination of the four billion year old power projection game. And it reminds me of that quote. I don't know who said it. You're free to ignore reality, but you are not free to ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. Yeah, war is interested. You may here. not be interested right. in war, but war is interested in you. Exactly. You may not be used to in, in people figuring out new and clever ways to project power to impose physically prohibitive costs on people. Yes. Right. You can kick that out of your country, but you're not going to be free from the consequences of making that decision. Right. And maybe it's not Bitcoin, but I guarantee you it's gonna be something that involves watts. Right. Yeah. That in <laughs> Yes, it's because to see how it could be anything else at this point. I mean, at least in the crypto asset universe. Well, let's put it this way. Let's assume Vitalik is right. Let's assume that Vitalik and the Ethereum developers have figured out a way to achieve the same complex emergent behavior of systemic security for this resource control system, which is what Ethereum represents. If he has figured out a way that you can achieve the same level of systemic security by, a, by an abstract form of virtualized power that does not physically exist, then the team of Ethereum developers are the first people to have figured that out in at least 5,000 years of people trying to codify formal sets of rules to instantiate abstract power-based resource control hierarchies. They're the first in at least 10, at least 7,500 years of people just trying to use abstract power resource control hierarchies generally. And they just figured out something that 4 billion years of natural selection hadn't learned yet. So <laughs> what's more good. likely? <laughs> They, they are wrong or they just outsmarted natural selection. They just outsmarted 10,000 years of other sapiens trying to do virtually the exact same thing. Ain't, Place ain't, your nobody, bets. Uh, ain't nobody outsmarting natural selection as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so um, good luck and I'll be waiting for you when that inevitably performs exactly as it has been designed to perform, exactly as all abstract power-based resource control hierarchies have been designed and exploited by rules. There's no amount of rules that can protect you against exploitation of rules because rules are the source of systemic exploitation, not the solution to systemic exploitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good luck. We'll see how that plays out, but I ain't touching that with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> and I hope that anyone listening to this doesn't either. I think that is a great place to bring it to a close. Mr. Lowry, as always, it is a 
honor and pleasure to speak with you. And I think you're doing a great job on the thesis and I look forward to continuing to read it. Thank you so much.